but I'm like a pluralist. I think like let a thousand flowers bloom. And like, I think it's great that we have a system where people can be doing like super esoteric stuff like my book and some people love it. But I think it's also good if philosophy is also like, let's get our hands dirty and actually like solve some, use philosophy to solve some societal problems. And I just think it's like a division of labor because like someone like me, I'm like, I'm just way more interested in the super esoteric stuff, but lots of brilliant people are interested in these like real world problems and philosophy can be used to be like, this is the right way to solve this problem. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Mark Balliger. He is Professor of Philosophy at California State University, uh, Los Angeles, and his work is focused primarily on metaphysics, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of logic, free will, and metaethics. His books include Platonism and Anti-Platonism in Mathematics, Free Will is an Open Scientific Problem, Free Will, uh, Metaphysics, Sovereignty, and Illusion, uh, this latter book is uh, going to be our primary focus for today. Um, he also has a variety of other publications. Feel free to add anything, but with that, uh, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Balliger. Thank you. Glad to be here. Awesome. So um, I read this book, uh, Metaphysics, Software and Illusion. Uh, there's a subtitle on that as well. And I thought it was a really interesting book. And, and um, pretty dense and a lot of like wide ranging um, philosophical meta uh, metaphysical issues in there. And um, I guess just to start out as an introduction um, to that, like, what do you, what did you see as your um, general project um, of that book? What are, you, what are you trying to, or what, did, what are you trying to accomplish uh, there? Um, I guess the main goal is to articulate a sort of general anti-metaphysical view. So like a, a view of what is going on in metaphysics that uh, um, covers all metaphysical questions and also um, is what I would call anti-metaphysical, meaning that um, there aren't really substantive metaphysical facts out there to discover that go beyond ordinary scientific facts. And I call the view neo-positivism and the book begins the argument for it. I think the argument to, in order to really argue for it, you would need like five books or something, but like, so I'm sort of describing a research program and then beginning the argument for it. I would say that's like broad brush strokes description of the book. Right. <laughs> very good. So, and you, you say like, um, like this anti-metaphysical, perhaps neo-positive positivism there. Um, one thing you kind of express at the beginning, okay, you wanna um, analyze metaphysical questions where, okay, there might, might be some vagueness, exactly what counts as a metaphysical question, but um, uh, whatever, we have a bunch of metaphysical questions anyway. And um, you think they're in some way gonna decompose into either some sort of um, empirical scientific question, um, perhaps some sort of innocent um, question about meanings or, um, uh, or about modality or, or something like that, or it's just gonna turn out to be something for which um, there's no fact of the matter, some non-factual. Um, is that roughly the kind of breakdown yeah, there? And how would you- That's that? roughly right. And the, the sort of, the sort of, modality thing i mean i think for for non-philosophers the easy way to think about that is that's just like sort of easy logical stuff and so that's really just to clean up leftover stuff like an easier way to think of it and like glossing over details is that metaphysical questions decompose into questions that are or either just ordinary empirical scientific questions that are just really hard and science can't answer them yet or there's no right answer to them. 
And that, that's like glossing over some subtleties, but like that's like the broad brushstrokes picture. <clears throat> right, and it's, it's almost, um, it's not quite, but it's like somewhat similar to a sort of scientism, right? Um, maybe well, in spirit at least, yeah. It's like scientism about half of the metaphysical questions and non-factualism about the other half. But the ones, the, the metaphysical questions for which you can't say, look, oh, this is just a really hard scientific question. There's no right answer. So it's like half scientism, half non-factualism. Right. Right. And, and importantly, in like um, the sort of methodology you're developing or you develop here, um, there's a big focus on um, language and conceptual analysis. When we ask these questions, like, are there abstract objects or are there mathematical objects? Um, well, what are we really asking? You know, like, what would it mean to say that there are such things and so on? And um, yeah, so I, I could maybe talk about why that's a big focus um, in your approach. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I kind of want to say it's not a big focus and in a way it is like, what. I mean, my view is that like philosophers in general want to ask these conceptual analysis questions. So like, here comes a question, are there any abstract objects? And then philosophers are like, well, wait, what, is, what does it mean to say there's an abstract object? What is that anyway? Or are there any numbers? And they're like, okay, well, what, what's a, what would a number be? Or is there any free will? And then philosophers first are like, what is free will? And so part of what I wanna say is that, I mean, the way in which I think we shouldn't focus on those is like, I think the right methodology is like, don't ever ask that question because it's not helpful for the real metaphysical questions. Like it's better to just introduce new terms with, with like stipulated meaning. So in the case of free will, instead of bogging down in the question of what free will is, just introduce some new lingo. So like, in broad brushstrokes, there's like a disagreement about what free will is among philosophers. Some of them think that it's the sort of like thin, not really hard to have thing that we could call Hume freedom, just because David Hume um, sort of was the first one to think of free will in this way. And the second one is this one that's like much more substantive and like maybe we don't have it and we can call that libertarian freedom. And philosophers are like, think it's really important to figure out whether free will is really Hume freedom or really libertarian freedom. But I think like a better strategy is just forget the term free will and use the terms Hume freedom and libertarian freedom. And then let's just ask, well, do which of these kinds of abilities do we have? Do we have Hume freedom? Do we have libertarian freedom? And then for Hume freedom, the answer is obviously yes. Like that's just very trivial. And then we're left with this question, do we have libertarian freedom? And I think that's the hard metaphysical question we should be asking. And so part of my Part of my view is that we shouldn't even be worried about what free will is, the conceptual analysis question. We should just move to this new question in this sort of like what I call a thick metaphysical language. Do we have libertarian freedom? But the way in which I focus on conceptual analysis questions is to make this point and to talk about them and to argue, like there's a whole chapter in the book about conceptual analysis, arguing that these are just empirical questions about what we mean by our words and they're not metaphysically important. So it's kind of like I'm focusing on those questions in the book in order to bring out the point that we shouldn't really focus on them in trying to answer metaphysical questions. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Actually, I think it's a very good point. And um, like with respect to free will, and this will be true in other areas as well, of course. Um, yeah, it's true that we can make more precise like the various questions that we might ask using the word free will. But also, um, it, it seems to me at least an interesting question, or a question that we might have interest in, which sort of thing people are normally committing to when they use this language, or like when they talk about free will. Like, I mean, if we want to answer the question, do we have free will? Okay, we might say, um, here's what we might say about whether we have um, Hume style free will. Here's what we might say about whether we have libertarian style free will. But which of those, if any, correspond to what people are normally talking about when they use a free will language? Um, and uh, like we might care about that too. I mean, what do you yeah. think about that? 
Uh, I mean, you might. And I, I think as a philosopher, I do care about it because philosophers just care about this question. I think that what we're caring about when we do that is an empirical question about what we mean by our words. And so it's at bottom a linguistic question. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about it because linguistics is interesting. And so you can be interested in like, yeah, what are we picking out? My own view is that a lot of time in philosophy, and I think free will is a good example of this, like there's no good answer to the question what we have in mind because we're imprecise. And so people have this concept of free will and they talk this way and they talk that way. And I think at the end of the day, the right thing to say is like, oh, sometimes we're thinking of one kind of free will and sometimes we're thinking of another kind. And we don't, um, we're not very good at noticing that we're switching back and forth like that. And so if the question is what, which kind of freedom do we have in mind when we talk about free will, the answer is like both really, just we're kind of in inconsistent like all over the place in our usage and i think that kind of situation is like common with these philosophically loaded words that like the are as like folk usage just normal english there's not really like a, a one correct precise definition um i think that's an interesting point about us um but i think it's linguistically interesting and not really metaphysically interesting yeah yeah that's that's a good point i mean i i've been thinking something like this is like probably pretty widespread in that for a lot of um the language that people use um that have that's been discussed by philosophers um there's really a lot of variability um perhaps indeterminacy vagueness um in how people are using it such that it doesn't really um it's not really amenable to the sort of more fine-grained dist uh, distinctions that philosophers tend typically want to make you know if you look in i would want to say something similar perhaps in epistemology maybe in ethics um and maybe not many other things as well so I, um but you're right i thought on the other hand that okay this is a fact about maybe folk usage and um language and not doesn't really have some significant um, metaphysical import. We can still ask, we can still ask these precise enough metaphysical questions, and um, you know, try to answer those and so on. So, like, I guess that's what you're trying to get at, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I just agree with everything you said exactly. I think like the right way to do metaphysics, if you're trying to figure out the nature of the world, is to forget the folk term, st like introduce these new terms of art, like libertarian freedom and Hume freedom and stipulate exactly what you mean. And then we can ask, do we have that? And in the Hume freedom case, it's like, yeah, we have it. And in a libertarian case, it's like, oh, maybe not. We got to go look at how the brain works and see if we have that. Um, but that's the right way to figure out the nature of human decision-making uh, processes is to use very clearly defined terms and not worry about whether it's the folk term free will. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on, totally on board with that. So then, um, talking about non-factualism generally, um, for, for a metaphysical question or for, you know, any other question in principle, for what you want to say, non-factualism is true. There's no like fact of the matter about it. You don't want to say, generally speaking anyway, that it's like meaningless or something like that. It's a meaningful statement or question. It's just, there's no fact of the matter about its truth. Um, that's right. Like there's some people that worry that, um, well, are you committing to there being like truth value gaps here? Or, I mean, what, what um, what's going on there? Like yeah. how could it be meaningful, but no fact of the matter. Yeah. I'm committing to truth value gaps. I mean, like to use a, an example, that's like not completely uncontroversial, but a lot more uncontroversial than the metaphysical case. If we just take, a um, like a vague term, like, um, tall, like, and we line up the humans from the shortest to the tallest, you know, 8 billion people. And at the one end of the spectrum, we've got a person that's definitely tall. At the other end, we have a person that's not tall. In between, every two people that are standing next to each other are like, their height is indistinguishable to any normal, you know, human perception of them. Uh, and if you think, 
that there are so then construct sentences for each one like person one is tall person two is tall person three is tall um if you think there are no truth value gaps, that means you can you think there's a place where you can divide the line in the middle with two people that look the same and go, that one's tall and that one's not tall. That sentence is true, that one's not true. Like you might think that, some people think that. I think that's really implausible. I think some of those sentences don't have truth values. Uh, this is a really hard problem in itself. I don't have a well worked out view of vagueness, but it's at least initially plausible that the right thing to say is some of these sentences just don't, there's just no fact of the matter whether this person in the middle is bald, is, sorry, is tall. Maybe I switched to bald in the middle, I'm not sure. Um, but I, my own view is that like, I'm not sure exactly how to work it out, but some of those sentences just lack truth value. And in the metaphysical case, I think something similar is happening. It's not vagueness, but there's semantic imprecision that makes it the case that some metaphysical thesis is imprecise enough that it just doesn't have a truth value in something like the same way that happens with vagueness. Yeah, I'm definitely sympathetic to that, um, at least in, when it comes to vagueness. Um, I did talk with Michael Humer a few weeks ago, and his approach to this is to think, okay, when we um, make statements, or including vague statements, what we're Attempting to do, perhaps, is to express a proposition. Propositions themselves are perfectly precise, non-vague. Um, and um, when we make vague statements, we sort of underdetermine which precise proposition we're expressing. And in a way, our statement, therefore, isn't strictly speaking meaningful because it's not expressing a unique proposition. He says something like, Sort of, he says something similar in the case of um, uh, uh, talking about like the liar sentence. There, we overdetermine which proposition we're expressing, so we don't express one either. And this allows him to say, well, the vague statements, liar sentences, not really meaningful because they're not expressing a unique proposition. Either they overdetermine or underdetermine the proposition that they're expressing. Um, if that makes sense. Or what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about that? Like, it approach? makes perfect sense. I, yeah. I, I think I disagree with that approach for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, it's a view. It's like, you know, that's a decent view. He's a good philosopher. Um, um, one problem I have with that is that, like, yeah, you can go, it's, I stipulate, here's what I mean by meaningful. It's to express one of these propositions. Um, okay, so it's not meaningful in some technical sense, but it's not like, blah, 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 gobbledygook, right? Like that really is genuinely meaningful. The sentence that like Jim is tall uh, is meaningful in some sense. So it's not fully, I mean, you just, that's just undeniable, it seems to me. Um, so that's one problem with the view is that it, you're not really getting a meaningless sentence there. Um, even if you stipulate that it's meaningless in some technical sense of meaning. But another problem I have is that um, he seems to be committed to some sort of sparse view of propositions, whereas I think like the only coherent view of propositions is that the space of propositions is a plenitude, which means any possible proposition actually exists. And that means propositions where the proper propositions that correspond exactly to our vague intentions exist. And so there can be prop like those precise propositions that Mike Humor's talking about are fine, but there's also, in addition to them, propositions that are, are vague and lack truth value because the, the predicate portion of the proposition corresponds exactly to our usage and intentions of is tall. And so the proposition we're actually expressing is the one that lacks truth value. And it's just an ex, extra proposition that exists over and above the ones that Mike Humor believes in. And I think that's the one that we're expressing because that's the one that corresponds to our actual linguistic intentions. Yeah, so I guess two things. Um, one, one is, it's true, right? Um, that on the one hand, if he's committing to these being, all these vague statements and predicates being, strictly speaking, meaningless, well, okay, but we still use them. We still seem to um, uh, communicate in some sense with them, like, 
how can we explain that if they're just meaningless? And then part of his project is trying to recover some some sense of that, even if they're strictly speaking meaningless. Um, I guess, you know, to me, I felt like, okay, um, we can, if we want, stipulate that those are meaningless and come up with some other vocabulary to talk about how they're being used and communicated and so on. And that will preserve what he wants in terms of like the logical facts, maybe, you know, he doesn't want two contradictions. He doesn't want um, two valley gaps. But to me, this just seems like a, I don't know, almost like an aesthetic choice. Like we're just deciding to um, talk in this way. Um, we're calling these things um, propositions, these things meaningful that they express those things. And um, we get out this sort of logical facts that we want to get out. But there's not something really deep, deeply true about that, if, you, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, that's right to me too. Um, I, I think a better way around, I, I, th I think a better way around like worrying about like losing classical logic is just to realize that like, as long as you have semantic precision, you will have classical logic. So if you want classical logic to work, just be precise. And then you will in fact will preserve things like excluded metal. Um, and if you don't sure. have precision, you just won't. And that, that's just like, that's just the fact. That's how it seems to man. Like, yeah. 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 I'm on board with that. And then the second thing about um, you mentioned how he seems to be at least implicitly committed to um, like the plenitude, plenitudinousness of uh, um, propositions. Um, well, I mean, it's, sorry, he's, he's committed to the sparseness of them. And you want to say, well, a more plenitudinous view would include these other propositions. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna, I guess we're going to come to this when we talk about abstract objects, but um, uh, or mathematical objects specifically. Um, but I think he would say, no, 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 I do believe any possible proposition there can be, I think it exists in a sense. But like a sort of requirement for counting its proposition is that it has to be precise. Um, and um, I mean, but, why that is, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> but that, this is like back to this, like, okay, you can stipulate that if you want. This is just back to the thing I was saying about meaning. Like you can stipulate a definition of like proposition that means, and then sit and go, oh, those things aren't propositions. But I, I want to say like, okay, but there are these other things like propositions. And that's the thing that's actually expressed. It might not count as a Mike humor proposition, but it's the thing that actually, it's the, the thing in that's in platonic heaven that corresponds to our usage and intentions of these sentences. And so like, that's the thing we're expressing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, like to kind of think in these ways, like, it's like, um, okay, you can use propositions quote unquote is um, humor thinking about them and you get the logical facts as humor is thinking about them um, and some other things that come along with that. Um, but we could also, talk in terms of propositions, and then maybe there you get logical facts that are not the same sort of facts that he would want to say um and neither of them is just like fundamentally correct or something like that it's just different ways that we might talk in perfectly legitimate ways um, or both are fundamentally correct yeah sure right? this this, this shm logic is the right logic of these propositions. And classical logic is the right logic of these other things. And they just have different subject matters or something like that, or overlapping yeah. subject matters. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's fair. Like I, I guess what I have in mind is that like, well, neither of them is like the right way to talk or something like that. You know, like we yeah. should, it's not like I said, we like in some objective sense, maybe should be using um, the logical and um, propositional language as he uses it um, over some other alternatives. Um, because those other alternatives might be perfectly meaningful and useful for carving up things and so on. Um, yeah. yeah. So like a community of speakers that were super precise and spoke the Mike humor language where they were always express, expressing propositions in his sense of the term, would they have it? Would they be better off? Like maybe they get to go, look, all of our sentences have truth values. Like, okay. Is your life better because of that? Are your theories better because of that? It's not clear that they are. 
yeah actually that's going to come back up um when we um well when it comes to some of the stuff on abstract objects later but um yeah i think i think that's right um it's like you could imagine this this society that um every utterance they make does express one of these precise propositions or just a proposition as you might think about it and um well i mean it could be that really they lack uh, a lot of the ways of um talking that we what we have that are quite useful um but also aside from that supposing that they're very different from us as like creatures and um are able to talk in this language in a very to them useful and precise way okay and like what why does that um to, to, is that something we should strive for i don't doesn't seem doesn't seem right to me um so maybe that's part of your point yeah i agree yeah. All right, so I think, um, yeah, I think it's good to now turn specifically to um, mathematical objects. And um, the first thing to talk about, I think, is, um, well, the realist views or the like um, small p Platonist views about um, what uh, they're supposed to be. Um, you know, non-spatio-temporal, non-causal um, objects of a certain sort. Um, how would you, um, actually, I guess there's two things. One, how would you um, construe the maybe philosophical sense of what an abstract object is? And do you think that, I think there's something mentioned in passing in the book, but I don't really get into it. Um, do you think that people normally when they use mathematical language are committing to something like this or or not or um, what do you think I, I think there's a lot of vagueness in what's going on with what people normally mean when they talk well sorry let me first answer your first question i i think you were just asking can you tell us what an abstract object is as, as, i mean it's just there's like physical objects in the world and then there's like we have mental like ideas in our heads and the Platon the platonistic view of math when we say things like three is prime and two plus two equals four and there are infinitely many prime numbers um we're talking about numbers and the numbers are these things it's like zero one two three and then they keep going forever and there's an infinite number of them and the on the platonist view those are not physical objects. You're not going to like find the number three in Cleveland somewhere. And they're not mental objects. The number three is not like an idea in Madonna's head. They're abstract objects. And an abstract object is non-mental and non-physical. And like the metaphor is that like it exists in platonic heaven. Um, like that's probably the best way to like get your, get into the like headspace of this view. But like the more precise way to put it is just they're non-physical, non-mental objects. They exist outside of space and time. They're non-causal. And they're not just the numbers. So that, that's the Platonist view. So this question, do we normally commit to this? Look, I mean, what we normally commit to is very vague and fuzzy and like a normal person just saying like, I need three oranges. I don't think they're committing to abstract objects when they're like, I, I bought three oranges at the store. But when they start talking about numbers, like two plus two equals four, I feel like they probably, the best view of their, what they mean probably does say that because I think like the best, I think there's just overwhelming arguments for the claim that the best interpretation of the discourse of mathematicians when they talk about numbers is the Platonistic one. That's what mathematicians are talking about. Um, and then I think it just sort of bleeds it. There's like an expert to non-expert bleed when, when non-experts are talking about numbers. I think like the semantics, the, probably the best overall view is that the semantics is just borrowed from the experts. And so when normal people are just talking straight up about numbers, you know, and saying like, oh, like little kids, like my favorite number is 17. Like they're talking about an abstract object is probably the best interpretation, even though they don't know they're talking about it, right? It's just, there's no other interpretation of what they're saying that's compatible with what they're saying. All the other interpretations are incompatible with them. The Platonistic interpretation is compatible with it. So even though normal speakers aren't aware that they're referring to abstract objects, 
I think probably the best overall semantic theory is that they just are. Yeah, my, maybe part of what's going on in there is that, okay, mathematicians and other experts are generally committing themselves to sort of Platonism. And in the case of um, more general folk discourse involving mathematical terms, there's some sort of semantic deference going on or something like that, where there's like, like if you ask someone, you know, what is the number seven? Like, oh, they might say things, some things, I guess, but like, uh, you know, what mathematicians take it to be, maybe. <laughs> um, and then if I they're mean, deferring I in actually, that way. Yeah. I guess, I would guess that most people would like say something close to what a mathematician would say. They'd be like, first of all, they'd be like, what the hell are you asking? But if they finally like wanted you to just like understood that we wanted them to just answer it like straightforwardly, they'd be like, it's the number right after six. Mm. And I, and I think like the number that comes between six and eight, and I, th I think like mathematicians can't really do better than that. I mean, if you want a definition of seven, it's probably just the successor of six. Well, okay, but if if that's um, what um, people normally and um, mathematicians maybe generally are would say about what the number seven is, um, like I maybe this is going to turn on when when we think um, existentially quantified statements are ontologically committing. You know, if someone's saying, you know, there exists a number between six and eight. Um, are they committed to, you know, there being this object, uh, the number seven? Because um, on some, you know, if you're Quine and blah, 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 you, um, that just follows immediately. But um, there might be some reason to, to be a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, are you convinced of that or what, what do you think about that? I'm convinced of that. I mean, I think, yeah. I think the only, I mean, like Jody Azuni would resist that. I don't know that there's anybody that really endorses his view. Then there's this sort of Minongian view that people like Graham Priest and Richard Routley have. But like, honestly, I think the best interpretation of their view is that they are committing to it. It's just, they're not committing to what they would call the existence of it. They're committing to what we would call the existence of it. And they're committing to something else that they would call like subsistence or something like that. So I like, I think even like minus the Minongians and Azuni, like I think everybody believes that. And I think even the Minongians believe some watered down version of it. And like, so Jody Azuni is like the only person that's just like wholesale rejects it, I would think. The only person I know of. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's fair. And then, okay, so then in talking about, um, you know, and the, on the Platonistic story, at least, what would be the case? You argue that the mathematical objects, the mathematical reality would be plenitudinous. There would be any like mathematical objects or structures or relations that like are consistent. Um, they are there in the Platonic story, at least. Um, um, and do you think this has for the Platonists is like the way that they should go because of it, um, like certain epistemic concerns and other things. Like maybe you could talk about this briefly. Yeah, so on the Platonist view, as I was just describing, like these things are like outside of space and time. And then an objection is like, and, and they think like our mathematical knowledge is knowledge of these abstract objects. So when like, you know, when mathematicians like Euclid in particular proves that there's infinitely many prime numbers, like we just learned something about platonic heaven that there's infinitely many prime numbers there. And then an objection can come like, wait a minute, here we are in space time with our five senses. Like how, how on earth could we know what, how could we know anything about platonic heaven? We couldn't know anything about it, yet we do have mathematical knowledge. So our mathematical knowledge is obviously not knowledge of that. It's gotta be something else. And so this view just can't be right. Um, and uh, so I think that there's a response to this from the Platonists, which is that if, you know, platonic heaven or the mathematical realm or whatever you call it is a plenitude. And again, what that means is that basically every possible mathematical object exists. Um, if it's a plenitude, then we get this result that 
every consistent purely mathematical theory accurately describes some objects, right? Because as long as the theory is consistent, it's possible, it's telling a possible story. And so if all the possible objects exist, then the objects corresponding to this theory exist. And so that like makes it really easy how we could have knowledge of these things, right? So here's a sort of like example of how the, the, the story goes, right? Like, so we start doing arithmetic and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a, I'm going to, build an, a theory of arithmetic about the natural numbers. And so here's what I mean by the natural numbers. They start with zero, it's the first one, and then one, and then two, and then three, and every number has a successor, so they go forever. Okay, I'm gonna start proving some results about that. And Euclid like proves like there's infinitely many primes and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody says, wait, but how do you know? How do you know the numbers don't just stop after the number 16? Like they just go up to 16 and then just stop. We have no access to the realm, how do you know? So there's not infinitely many primes. There's not even infinitely many numbers. There's only 16 numbers or 17 if you count zero, I guess. And the response, is, the response from the Platonist who endorses the plenitude is, oh, there is a structure like that. We could do a theory about that. I'm just stipulating that I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about the one that keeps going. And I know that one exists because they all exist. Um, and so we could, when I'm done here, we could have a, we could theorize about your structure that stops at 16. Now it turns out that nobody actually ever will do that because it's boring um, and uninteresting, but we could because it's real, it's there. Um, and so this sort of like takes the teeth out of the epistemic worry. Like anything that we can like conceptualize, as long as we're not contradicting ourselves, it'll be there. And then we stipulate, oh, we're talking about those objects and we lay down axioms, picking out precise that one that we have in mind and then we can prove theorems about it does that make sense yeah it does i mean i'm kind of struggling to think of how someone would uh with a spark more sparse view um might respond to that um i mean maybe someone could try to push the idea that um the the sort of mathematical structures and theories um that we commit to in say science, um, those exist because, um, well, because because of certain facts about the actual world that they're like applicable to the world or something like that. I don't know. Um, maybe I, someone I, could try. Yeah. I mean, as long as you think abstract objects are causally inert, you're going to think that what the physical world is like has, has plays no role in determining what the platonic world is like. So I don't know how you would get that, but like, also, I just think like, if you have a sparse view, you can't solve the problem of knowledge. And so the view is just bad for that reason. And I think it's also really arbitrary, right? It's like, you know, a lot of people have a Platonistic view of like colors, right? Like any property really. So like you think like redness and roundness, those are properties, but like, imagine somebody going, well, I believe that redness exists, but not blueness. Like, <laughs> That's a really weird view, right? And likewise, it's a weird to go, well, I believe that the natural numbers exist, but not the, the real numbers. Like, okay, but that's like saying red exists, but not blue. It's just a bizarre view of how abstract objects work. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think you mentioned this, like it's like a weird gap almost in the um, <clears throat> Platonistic realm, you know, there's, there's there's these things and there's these other things and there's like there could have been other these other sort of structures here in some sense but they just don't exist and there's like no further explanation of that perhaps um, seems yeah. like a good to go and and um, so that's like one of the issues and then the other thing is the epistemic worry um, yeah which is kind of I agree it's like a, a very serious issue I'm I know there's something that people, a lot of people have written on but um, I don't think a lot of progress has been made defending that um, or overcoming the worry, um, aside from this sort of response. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think the other responses out there work, but I think this one just does work. <clears throat> right. Um, and now you want to turn and say, well, actually, first, um, you, you want to point out or argue that um, the abstract object question as a metaphysical question is 
falls under the non-factual category. There's no fact of the matter about whether there are um, abstract objects. Now, um, yeah, I mean, broadly, why would what's the kind of reasoning that you you give there for for that conclusion? I mean, because someone might say like, well, it seems perfectly sensible. There either are these objects or there aren't. Uh, it seems like there should be some fact of the matter. Um, we get to so, your response on that. So roughly, the argument is based on the idea that the sentence abstract objects exist and also abstract objects don't exist. Um, they're wildly imprecise in a way that makes it the case that they don't really have genuine truth conditions. And so they don't have truth values. Um, and the argument for that is long. I mean, there's a whole chapter arguing for this thesis. So I'm not going to like give the whole argument, but like roughly speaking, the argument is based on the idea that like, I think I like when student like in when students in philosophy classes first hear about abstract objects, I think there's a lot of befuddlement. Right. So you're like, you know, so I was trying to explain this before, but I think people when they first hear it are like, wait, what? So the number three exists just like the moon does, but it's not a physical object. It's not an idea in our head. And it's just sort of like exists in this non-physical, sorry, I had my phone on, in this non-physical way. Like, what? And I think like the student that, and then like the professor keeps going and and like sooner or later the student's like, okay, I think I understand. And like maybe they take a few more courses and they just get really comfortable with it but like i think they were onto something at the beginning and i think that like even after like you know we write a book on platonism and we're like experts if you like just go back to that first moment you're like what are you actually saying about reality when you say that the numbers exist in platonic heaven like what you know i mean the platonic heaven is a metaphor so you don't actually think that there's like a place with clouds and you can go and you go like oh there's the number seven Right, like nobody thinks that. Like they exist in a non-physical way and a non-temporal way and a non-spatial, like non-mental. Like it's just like okay, that's a lot of what it's not. <laughs> what is it? And like, I think that like basically, we just have no idea what the world needs to be like to count as a world in which abstract objects exist. And so, the dispute between the Platonist who says they exist and the anti-Platonist who says they don't is just like broken because it's too unclear what would even be needed to make them exist. And so like, that's a really brief description. The argument is sort of long and complicated, but roughly that's the idea is that like, we just haven't done enough to make clear what the sentence even says about reality. Yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking like, but what if we say that, um, okay, a, a fair amount of the way we're defining abstract object um, is by negation, right? They're not spatial, they're not temporal, they're not causal and so on. Um, but, and that is like somewhat vague. It doesn't tell us a lot about um, what they really are aside from these things that they're not. Um, but, okay, I mean, could be things that satisfy those those descriptions. I mean, why not? Like, and if there were, um, if there was something that wasn't spatial, there was something that wasn't temporal. Um, maybe it had these other attributes. Um, why couldn't that serve as a, you know, abstract object or mathematical object? Like, it could if the, if if so. You're giving a description. There could be a thing that was non-physical and non-mental. And I'm like, but I already argued that, like. There's no fact of the matter whether any scenario, like, so here's a way to think about it. Um, imagine two worlds that are physically identical and in one of them, abstract objects exist and in one, they don't. And I'm like, okay, what, what's the difference? And you're like, all, I think all Platonists can say is, oh, they're there in the one case and in the other one, there aren't. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't understand what you're saying about the difference. Like, I'm just sort of the argument kind of bottoms out in this thing like i don't get it and now like in the comment you're making now you're like you're sort of pulling back from my thing about the be two two worlds and you're like oh it could just be that we come upon these things and we're like oh there it is the thing that's but like the way i want to think about it is like no like i if my argument's right like i've already argued that anything you could come upon 
there'd be no fact of the matter whether it satisfied that because we haven't said what the thing that we're trying to satisfy is something like that yeah well obviously we wouldn't be able to come upon it like literally because there's they're non-causal we couldn't interact with them in that way but right. um <laughs> but uh like i guess maybe the idea is that there's um conceptually speaking uh a lot of things that could count as um these abstract mathematical objects um because our you know as you say our description of them isn't horribly precise but i mean why couldn't there be things that uh, satisfy those descriptions even if our descriptions don't sort of like aren't um don't pickle at all the properties of those things or don't like um uh aren't very aren't precise enough to to know oh precisely that thing you know but that's the sort of thing that can satisfy the description i guess determinate determinable thing going on here but um i don't know so sense. suppose i you came upon two people arguing about whether they're band or snatches um and you were like wait you who believe in bandersnatches what what does the world need to be like what, to have a bandersnatch what's that and they're like there has to be bandersnatches and they're like can you say more like no there has to be bandersnatches and then you turn to the other person and you're like what are you denying the person's like i'm denying there are bandersnatches and they're like what what do you mean by that i'm like there are no bandersnatches can you say more about it no okay so now we you and me are both listening to this and i'm like look this is not a thing and you're like well you know who knows maybe there's a thing out there that's a banner snatch and i'm like okay but like what like we don't like that's not saying anything and now i don't think it's that bad like i don't that because banner banner snatch is meaningless and i don't think it's meaningless but i think it's like not picked out what they're at like when this abstract object talk is not meaningless but it's failing to pick out a way the world is and so my response to the argument is, is the same as my response to the Bandersnatch argument. It's like, sorry, I can't take sides in this. I don't think you guys are picking out two different possible realities. And like, I can't say which way I think the world is because I don't think you've described two different possible ways for the world to be. You're, so in the abstract object case, it's meaningful, but they're not picking out two different ways for the world to be. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just not, I can't take sides in this because you're not, saying anything in the sense of like picking out a way for the world to be yeah no, i guess that makes sense i mean I, maybe the worry that i'm expressing here not that well maybe <laughs> is that um it might be true that they're not picking out um like precise ways the world can be but i i mean it seems that i mean i think like, yeah like I see what you're getting at. Vaguely, like, ways work. Yeah. If it was, if they were doing like a half-ass job, and like then I could be like, oh, maybe then there's going to be a fact of the matter. But what I think, and like this requires argument, I'm not saying it doesn't, is that they're just not even doing that. It's catastrophic failure to pick out a way that the world is. That that's my claim. Maybe I'm wrong, but if I'm right that there's a catastrophic failure to pick out a way that the world is and not just like a failure to pick it out a very precise way then that's how you could get a lack of um truth conditions now another way that somebody might respond to this is to go oh you're thinking of it wrong because a way the world is that like it's like you think that there's a possible world with abstract objects and a possible world without and the right way to think about this is that it's whichever answer is true is necessarily true. Um, so there's a section of the book where I argue against that and go like, we, the necessitarian view is not acceptable in the Platonist camp or the anti-Platonist camp. And so if there's a fact of the matter about this, there better be two different possible worlds. That it's contingentism is gonna be true, but that's based on this argument against the necessitarian view. Right, and and you turn that into sort of argument as well, right? And um, this comes up in the the composition section as well, which is that look, it's it's not necessary that this thesis is true. 
but it's also not contingent. Um, yeah. It's not impossible either, I guess. Um, so uh, just to be no fact of the matter, then that's the kind of um, only outcome. That's like another argument for non-factualism that you can employ here. I think, I think that argument, I don't run that argument explicitly in the abstract object case, but I think it's lurking right beneath the surface of the way I do argue it. Right. I mean, there's yeah. a straight up argument against necessitarianism. And then one way to read the rest of the thing is like, oh, he's really arguing against contingentism here. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, you make it, you exp explicitly reason in that way in the, um, the composite object case. And um, perhaps you'd apply it as something similar elsewhere as, as well. But um, yeah, it seems to me that it's the sort of thing that might be effective um, in the abstract object case too. Yeah. Um, I suspect though that more, um, that most people who adopt uh, Platonistic views are, are gonna wanna stick to the necessary um, view. Um, and- um, I agree. And so, but so, and so what would you, what do you, or would say, what would you say against, um, well, against them you, maintaining this? Sorry to interrupt. The, the, yeah, I just think the view is false. Like, I think even if you're going to be a Platonist, you shouldn't endorse that view. And roughly, it, it's because, I mean, nothing exists necessarily. Like, we're talking about the broadest kind of possibility here. Possibility is super cheap. We can, if, if we assume for a moment that abstract object talk is clear enough for there to be a fact of the matter, so we assume factualism, then I think there's a straight up argument for contingentism, which is like, oh, I can conceive of both Platonism and anti-Platonism easily. I can conceive of these things. I'm supposed to assume, we're assuming that there's a real question of whether these things exist. I'm like, okay, I can conceive of that they exist and I can conceive that they don't. And uh, I don't have any argument for, for the impossibility. Like sometimes it seems like we can conceive of something, but then we get like a little argument like, oh, we weren't really conceiving of that. Um, this is actually impossible. But in this case, there's no good argument that Platonism or anti-Platonism is impossible. And so we get like the seeming conceivability combined with the fact that we have no good argument to think it's not genuinely possible. It gives us a pretty strong prima facie reason to think like, oh, both Platonism and anti-Platonism are possible. Uh, and so we should be contingent us. Because just, just, I mean, imagine I said to you that like, I think worlds, it's in, like the non-existence of donkeys is impossible. Like there's no possible world with donkeys in it. And you're like, wait, wait why do you think that? And I'm like, oh, I just, I don't have an argument. Like we'd be like, okay, that's really a bizarre view. And then you go, well, what's the argument that they're possible? Like the argument is just like, well, I can conceive of donkeyless worlds. There's no reason to think they're impossible. Like possibility is cheap and i think the same sort of flat-footed reasoning works here like preface on the assumption that there's a fact of the matter that abstract object talk is clear enough for there to be a fact of the matter it looks like we can just conceive of both answers and there's literally no reason to think either is impossible now you might think there are good arguments but in the book i like run through the arguments that you might try that Platonism or anti-Platonism is impossible. And I just argue that they're all bad arguments. And so we're left with them both being possible. Right. Yeah, I don't, don't remember if you cover um, what I'm going to say in a second, but um, what would you say to um, someone who said, well, I'm going to say something about propositions, but I think something similar might be said about um, mathematical truths. Um, there are necessary propositions, like there are ne necessary truths, um, uh, presumably, like metaphysically necessary truths. Well, what that would require is, like, at each world that that statement is true. Um, but a statement being true requires some truth bearer, um, which is a proposition. And so that will require that proposition exists at that world, um, and that's true for every world. So, and propositions are... Um, perhaps abstract objects. Um, and so there are propositions at every possible world. And perhaps you can say something similar about mathematical entities. One plus one equals two, it too wait, is true wait, at every possible me, world. 
Yeah. Can I respond to that first before sure, the sure. mathematical case? Because I won't be able to remember. Um, sure, sure. So I think there's a move there that I don't think is right from necessarily true to the truth bearer has to be necessarily true. So right. I'm going to say, I'm going to me, Mark, right now, I'm going to say something. Um, snow is white, or it's not the case that snow is white. Um, or like to get it even more, it's not the case that both snow is white and it's not the case that snow is white. So I'm just saying a, a certain contradiction isn't true. Okay. Consider now, uh, let's just talk about that, my very utterance of it. So Mark's utterance, and I'm going to go, Mark's utterance is necessarily true. The thing I uttered is necessarily true. But if we move, like you move, wanted to move to the necessarily existence of the proposition, but I want to go, well, in this case, I'm talking about an utterance, not a proposition. And the utterance is necessarily true. So if your reasoning is correct, you'd be like, well, the utterance then must exist in all possible worlds. And then Mark must exist in all possible worlds. So Mark is a necessary being. And I'm like, wait a minute, that can't be right. The problem is that my, my utterance that exists in this world is true at every single world, even if it doesn't exist there. And that's what I mean when I say it's necessarily true. So same for a proposition. Um, some proposition could be necessarily true. And that means that it is true at every world, but it doesn't have to exist in those worlds. If that were required, then before you could believe that, you know, the necessary proposition is necessary, you'd have to think that Platonism is necessary. And I'm like, nobody thinks that, right? Um, and so I just think like, Worlds without propositions are easy to conceive of, just like worlds without me. Um, but that doesn't mean that the thing I said isn't necessary. And it doesn't mean that the proposition in the actual world isn't necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when you say that um, it wouldn't have to, the, like the proposition or the utterance or whatever, wouldn't have to exist at every world for it to be true at every world. Well, how are, how are we understanding um, it being true at every world. Um, like you, maybe this, 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 the thought is that um, if truth at a world just requires that um, the, what it asserts about the world is satisfied or something like that. Um, maybe something about truth makers or something about not necessarily truth makers, but about the world more generally um, is obtains or something like that. But then I mean, maybe that's what you're saying, or yeah. on the other like, hand, let's say I yeah. let's say I wrote the sentence down instead of saying it, I wrote it down. I've got it written on this post-it note, so I'm not going to take the time to do it. But pretend that that necessarily true sentence, and I'm like, this one, this pile of ink right here, is necessarily true. And it seems like it is because it's just stating an instance of the law of non-contradiction. And what I mean is, like, if we evaluate this sentence here that I've got in my hand. If we evaluate each, if we evaluate this thing at each world, it keeps coming out true. But that doesn't mean I have to think like this piece of paper exists in each world, right? Clearly, that's not right. But yeah, the thing it's saying, the thing it's saying, is true at every world. That just means if we evaluate this one in the actual world, at those other worlds, it keeps coming out true. Right. I mean, I think um, a lot of Platonists would say is that the paper or what you've written there is ex expressing in some way a proposition or you're using it to express a proposition and that proposition does exist at all I, but that, look, yeah they can say that and maybe that's true but that's not what i'm saying i'm saying not that some proposition is true but that the utterance is true maybe it's true because of the propositions existing but i'm saying this is necessarily true so they have to either say it's not necessarily true because it doesn't exist necessarily, which is, strikes me as a weird thing to say. Or they have to they have to admit that a thing doesn't have to exist at a world to be true at a world. They um, certainly can't say that this exists at every world. I mean, maybe Williamson would say that, but hmm. that's right. Well, he's yeah, necessitism and so on. Um, but I think. I think some of them would say that it's like maybe some sort of category mistake then to say that, you know, this is true, let alone necessarily true, because um, like the piece of paper, the ink is not itself, rather than the proposition expresses, 
is not the sort of thing that's like truth apt, right? So like to say that it's true or necessarily true is just some sort of category mistake. I don't, I don't know. I mean, now yeah. I want to say the same thing I was saying earlier. Like, yeah, you can stipulate that true only applies to propositions. And you've got this weird word true that, but like in normal English, we use true to apply to utterances. Um, and even if we don't in normal English, like there, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it conceptually saying that an utterance is true. I think it's pretty normal to be like the sentence written on the board is true and be like, what? That's a category mistake. Like, no, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And so, yeah, so I guess we could move on and then um, to talk about how you um, want to, while granting that um, the abstract object question is just like no fact of the matter, um, you still want to point out that it, I mean, you want to also take a sort of fictionalist approach maybe and say it doesn't really matter um, whether for our like everyday interests our scientific theorizing and so on, whether this sort of realm existed or not. Um, because you know, if, it, if it fell out of existence, like, okay, and like um, we still go on as we, as we would. So I don't know, maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I feel like the good making feature in mathematics, like a sentence counts as good or correct or something like that, just in case the way I want to think of this, it would have been true if Platonism had been true. Like if the objects had been there, then this would have been one of the true ones. So three is prime is good because, and four is prime isn't, because if Platonic heaven had existed, then three is prime would have been true and four is prime would have been false. Um, so call that for all call that fap truth for, that, for all practical purposes truth. So three is prime is fap true and four is prime is not. And all that means is the following counterfactual is true. If plenitudinous Platonism had been true, then three would have been prime. Um, and the court, the, the one for four is prime is if plenitudinous Platonism would have been true, then four would have been prime. So the first counterfactual is true and the second is false. And that makes three is prime fap true and four is prime not fap true. And so my view is like fap truth is actually the good making feature in mathematics that platonic heaven could like blip in and out of existence and three is prime would like flip back and forth between tr being true and false. But through all of it, it would be fap true because the counterfactual keeps being true and the numbers aren't doing anything. So like fap truth is the good making feature, not, not real truth. And so it just sort of doesn't matter if the abstract objects exist or if there's no fact of the matter whether they exist. Um, that's like roughly the view. Like, that's, I mean, there's a whole chapter developing this kind of fictionalism, but um, that's like roughly it. Yeah, I, I really like that actually. I mean, I could imagine someone saying that, wait a minute, your talk about how um, the platonic realm could come in and out of existence and um everything else would go on as it like unaffected because of like there's no causal connection between the platonic realm and the and the physical world um someone might think that that's in a way like um problematic right uh, in that wait a minute if these things didn't exist then like i don't know the world would be un unintelligible in some way or something like, you know, um, none of our scientific theories would make any sense or, you know, that, some people have this sort of response. I mean, does that make any sense to you or what do you think? About yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, these are the kinds of worries people raise. Like you're asking good questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think it's false. I think like our scientific theories wouldn't be strictly true. They wouldn't be meaningless. They would be very meaningful. And in fact, they would be fab true. They would be, I mean, assuming that our theories are true in the normal sense, like maybe we're going to discover a mistake in quantum mechanics tomorrow, but like not counting that, like quantum mechanics is fab true. What does that mean? It's like, it's, it's saying that the world is a way, that the physical world is that way. And the, if platonic objects just existed, then the theory would be true. And you're like, yeah, but like in science, like if you pull the mathematics out, doesn't like everything come unglued? And the answer is no, because 
the mathematical objects aren't doing anything to the physical world, even according to science. Science doesn't say, like we use, like here's just a, an easy example. We use real numbers to represent temperature states. Like in essence, we're using the real numbers as like names of the temperature states. Like in Fahrenheit, the number 32 is just a name of the temperature that's the freezing point of water. And this is super useful because the possible temperature states are like lined up in the exact same way that the real numbers are lined up. So it's like a really convenient naming system. But like nobody thinks that like the number 32 is like dropped into the water and makes it freeze, right? Like the number 32 is just a name of the, the physical thing. And so if the number 32 didn't exist, it's like, oh, well, whatever. The numeral 32 is still a useful way of, of communicating this fact. You know, so like, here's an analogy like that I make in the book. Like I say to you, oh, my dad's just like Homer Simpson. And you're like, oh, that can't be true because Homer Simpson's a fictional character. He doesn't exist. So your sentence that your dad is like Homer Simpson can't be literally true. I'm like, okay, whatever. My dad's like that anyway, right? And I communicate this fact about my dad by using this fictional object because we all have associated stuff associated in our heads with Homer. And it's exactly the same in the number case. I go like, you're like, how cold is it out? And I'm like, oh, it's 17 degrees outside Fahrenheit. And you're like, well, that can't be right because the number 17 doesn't exist. I'm like, okay, whatever. It's like that outside anyway. So you better wear a coat or you're going to be really cold. Yeah. I like those examples and that, and that uh, sort of response. It's like, um, for what we're trying to communicate and um, in those cases, it doesn't really matter that like there is this thing, the number 17, or there is this thing or person, Homer. Um, what matters is that um, like what sort of um, other properties or predictions you're trying to communicate, you're able to communicate in that way, even if in doing so, or an effective way to do so is to make a statement that's maybe strictly false, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So then I guess what falls out of this sort of approach immediately is that um, an objection to sort of like indispensability arguments um, for mathematical objects. Um, maybe you don't have to talk about that briefly. Yeah. Like I mean, I feel like, I, I feel like it does fall out of it. So I've sort of already answered it, but like the role that mathematics plays in science is that of a representational device or like a descriptive aid. Um, so it just doesn't need to be true to be useful. And you know, it depends how you articulate the indispensability argument, like account for the usefulness. I, well, I just did. I explained why it can be useful without being strictly true. Another way to put it is like, oh, we have to believe our scientific theories are true because the mathematics is like embedded in the science. And we think of our science is true. And I'm like, no, but you shouldn't think that your science is true. You should think that it's fab true. What does that mean? It, well, it means it would have been true if platonic heaven had just existed. So, yeah, I mean, that's basically the response to the indispensability argument. Right. And, it, and something else going on here that seems to me, or right, or at least um, something I'm um, amenable to is the idea that, look, we're not always just concerned about um, um, making true statements or figuring out what the truth really is in some sense. Uh, like you come across a fair amount of people like, oh, my inquiry, I'm primarily concerned about how, uh, the truth. That's, that's what I want, you know. But in many cases, it's like, to me anyway, I mean, I might care about what the truth, are, is, on, truth is on some matter. Um, and I do. Um, but a lot of the times I want something useful that helps me navigate the world, that helps me to um, achieve my goals and so on. And sometimes that's figuring out which things are true. Um, but sometimes it's figuring out, you know, which things are maybe fat true, <laughs> you know? Um, and I don't know, is that is, like, what do you think about that as a general idea? Or, I, I mean, uh, I agree. The things you care about, yeah. I agree. I think virtually always what we're interested in is fat truth. You know, like, so somebody, you're like, 
where's this city in Italy? And you're like, oh, it's in the heel of the boot. You're like, cool, got it. Like, that's not strictly true. There's no boot, but like, if the person gave you like the spatio-temporal coordinates or something, like you get on a cell phone, you'd be like, I, this is not helpful. Like, I, I mean, that's a, like an extreme case, but my own view is that like, we just all the time talked in terms of sentences that are strictly speaking false but they're fap true or useful. And like, that's what we actually want. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like in the, in the mathematical case of, I feel like someone might, someone might have a different response for, for me. Um, if I like, oh, I was committing to these, this platonic object um, in my scientific theorizing or other descriptions of the world and so on. And someone come up to me and said quite convincingly, oh, there are no such objects. and so, you know, all your statements and theories are strictly speaking false. Um, someone might have the response, oh, I guess I should, you know, dispense with all those theories then because I cared about the true theories. But for me, it's like, um, I mean, that's an interesting thing to um, realize perhaps that those theories are strictly speaking false, but um, they still serve a significant purpose um, in, understanding the world in certain ways and making certain predictions and navigating, you know, and I care about those things, even if the statements that I make and the theories I develop are strictly speaking false. So I'm not going to throw them out. I'm still going to use them because they serve the, um, a large part of the goals that I had with them. If that makes sense. I think a good way to think about this is in terms of like, what's the good making feature. And I think like, if you have this kind of view, like part of the view is that when you, when you learn that quantum mechanics is strictly speaking false, you're not criticizing quantum mechanics. You're not saying it's bad in any way because part of the view is that you were mistaken if you thought that the mark of a good theory in science was literal truth. It's not, it's fab truth. It's being such that like if plenitudinous Platonism had been true, then it would have been true. That's the mark of a good theory. So when I say, oh, it's strictly speaking false, I'm not criticizing theory. I'm not saying it's bad in any way. So it be wrong-headed to throw it out because it's a good theory. What does that mean when I say it's a good theory? It means it's fab true. That's the good making feature. Yeah. One potential word for this though, and applied to that case is that don't, we probably don't wanna say this across the board for every object or that the theory quantifies over. So for example, um, you know, we have some atomic theory and if someone were to come across and say, oh, actually, but atoms don't actually exist. And then you say, oh no, but, but, but for all like, um, you know, if atoms were to exist then this, this theory would be true. And so it's for all intents and purposes true. And that's what, that's what I care about for this theory. That might be a problem, right? Because like atoms as a theoretical posit are kind of like central to that theory. I mean, would you have the same response or would you have a, a different response in that case? So there's a, there's two different versions of this question and I'll try to make one, I'll make them both precise and then answer them because I want to answer them differently. Um, one, roughly speaking, to, I'll say at the start, one rough speak, like roughly speaking, one of the questions is based on the idea that like, oh, I'm a myriological nihilist and I don't believe in composite objects. And the other is based on some kind of like scientific anti-realism where I believe in tables and chairs, but I don't believe in electrons. Like I don't believe in unobservables you know, like a von Frossen kind of view. And I wanna answer those two questions very differently. So in the first case, you're like, look, there are no atoms because there are no composite objects at all. All there are, on my view, all there are like tiny space-time points and that's it. And then there's like, there's like, call those things simples. There are then simples arranged atom-wise and simples arranged table-wise and simples arranged dog-wise, but there are no dogs or atoms or tables. And I want to go, okay, in this view, in this case, like I want to endorse the same view I was adopting before. It's just that we have to redefine what FAP truth is. Now, FAP truth is um, if plenitudinous Platonism, to say that a sentence S is FAP true is to say that the following counterfactual is true. If plenitudinous Platonism had been true, and if atomism had been true, that like all these little particles exist. And if myriological universalism had been true, so that we can just combine, combine the, the particles in, in whatever we want to get a big object, like a table or a dog or an atom, 
If all of that had been true, then S. So fab truth is now defined at the, in the antecedent of the counterfactuals, not just plenitude and Platonism, but also atomism and neurological universalism. And now I want to just have the same view, like, oh, okay. So now the mark of goodness is this new kind of fab truth. And so there are atoms comes out fab true, and there are unicorns comes out not fab true, and everything is hunky dory. Um, and nothing, everything is strictly speaking false, but it's all fab true and it's fine. Now, if somebody comes along and goes, oh no, but I am like the old style scientific anti-realist, I'm fine with composite objects. I have no problem with tables and chairs. Um, I just don't think there are electrons. I don't believe in unobservables. And now this person tries to redefine fab truth again, and they tried to build not into the antecedent um, atomism and muriological universalism, but just plenitude and Platonism, and um, there are unobservables or something like that. And now they get a new fab truth. Now I want to go, sorry, that view is not my view. It's not analogous to my view, and I don't like it at all because the unobservables are causally relevant. You take the unobservables out, you take out electrons, and on my view, you just take out dogs and tables as well. Whereas in the case where you take out composites, like you're still left with simples arranged dog wise. So you haven't really taken out the dogs in any interesting way. Like there's still like bits of reality that are running around barking. Um, but when you take out the electrons and nothing else, it's like, oh, you just killed the dog. So I feel like on the way of understanding your original question as like a von Frossen question, I want to go, no, fab truth won't work here. But on the way of understanding it, like, um, like a Ted Sider kind of muriological nihilism thing, I'd be like, yeah, I have the same response to that. Um, and the, let yeah, me just say, the difference has to do with causal inertness. Like once you have the simples that the composite objects don't do anything. So they're like the numbers, they're just causally nothing. But in the von Frossen case, it's like, wait, if you're just pulling out electrons and nothing else, like those are causally relevant. That's the difference between the two cases. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think what I had in mind is not really quite either of those cases. Um, let me think about how to articulate this uh, better. Um, I think the idea is not anything like assume, um, you know, some sort of non nihilism about muriology, perhaps universalism, whatever, where at least the sort that um if there were things arranged electron wise or um or atom wise i'm not i'm also not saying that um i'm just pulling some um scientific anti-realist move which is that oh but we just don't have reason to think that there are such things or we have reason to think that there aren't because of you know underdeterminacy or um i don't know some pessimistic meta induction but something like that no, the idea is, um, let's just suppose that um, the kind of right view of the world is that um, there are no things, um, even arranged atom-wise, like, okay, um, that's, that's just, that's not something that's in the, that's there. Um, dogs are trees and so on, if we think there are such things. Um, they might be composite, but they're not composed of atoms, they're composed of something else. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe that helps to express it a little bit better. Um, Wait, so it, does this person, this person believes in dogs and tables, mm -hmm. but doesn't believe in atoms. How is this person different from von Frossen? Um, well, they might think that uh, we have good reason to, they might believe in unobservables. Um, you know, that, and perhaps they even think that those things like tables and dogs are made of other unobservable entity, entities, just not atoms. Like, oh, suppose, so, just the, yeah. so just the science is, the, our atomic theory is just false. Right. But like there might be some different, they just, yeah. yeah so, that, I mean, I, I consider that person to be just rejecting science in a bad way. Hmm. And like, there's all like, the more precise the view became, the more I would feel comfortable knowing just what to say. But like, I think one thing I want to say is like, you have no right to assert the counterfactuals in the way that I do. 
because if you don't believe in atoms, then I feel like what you should say is, oh, if atoms existed, then the world would be totally different. Because our like real dogs are made of something different. So if we just threw some atoms in, then like who knows what would happen? But it would they would be causally relevant objects that would affect reality. And so you can't, with that view, endorse the counterfactual. Oh, if atoms had existed, then blah blah blah. The only way, like hmm. my view, like my counterfactuals, they all have the following um, feature that like the thing that we're throwing into the antecedent, oh, if that existed, then these things would be true. Those things are all causally irrelevant. They're either like composite objects on top of simples. So they're like not doing anything extra or they're numbers, which are causally inert or something like that. As soon as you start throwing in causally relevant stuff, the con that affects reality. And so you can't go, oh, like the stuff we normally say would be true if we threw that in. It's like, no, it would all be false because reality would change. Whereas like in, in the cases I have, it's like we're throwing in stuff that's causally irrelevant. So it's not doing anything to the world. And so the sentences that we normally say would just be true because like the baggage that we're assuming would just be there, but they wouldn't okay, be right. the world. Yeah, I think I get it, right? Because uh, um, the difference between the kind of factuals you want to endorse and these ones perhaps is that, um, well, here we're taking out or putting in things that are make a causal difference, whereas you're not doing that. And um, that gives some reason to think that your counterfactuals are true and these ones are yeah, at, least, I mean, at least there's some doubt of them. Yeah. I feel like the counterfactuals this person would have to commit to are sort of like if somebody said, oh, if phlogiston were, if there were phlogiston, then, and I want to go like any counterfactual of that form, I don't believe it. Because if phlogiston, if you just dumped a bunch of phlogiston into the world, like who knows what that would do? Like, I don't, like, I'm not enough of a scholar of the history of science to know exactly what it was supposed to be, but it was supposed to be causally relevant. You just start chucking a bunch of causally relevant stuff in. It's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe we'd all be dead if phlogiston got put into the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could, this seems fair to me. I guess I could imagine someone trying to pull the move that, um, uh, well, it's true that um, atoms are like causally relevant if they exist. Um, but in this kind of factual, I can suppose that they would have played the same causal rules as, you know, whatever actually exists there. You know, like, oh, there's strings or something. Those aren't atoms or parts of atoms. And atoms would have played the same causal rules as those things. So you wouldn't get other sorts of differences on the macro or observable level or something like that. Yeah. I think maybe then I would believe those counterfactuals. So if the counterfactuals were like, if atoms existed and they somehow by some means caused the same macro level phenomena that we see, then we'd see the same macro level phenomena. I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. I'm not sure it really helps me believe the weird view that you have that there are no atoms, but like, I think those counterfactuals would be true. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think that um, satisfies my concerns I had about that. So before kind of briefly talking about the composite object stuff, although we kind of talked somewhat about it already. Um, and this is something that doesn't really come up in the book, but I, I think you have <laughs> talked about this. You did a closer, um, it came up on a closer to truth interview you had, which is done the sort of effectiveness of mathematics, I don't know, some people say in terms of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Um, and I, I recall you saying something like, well, it's actually not so surprising that mathematics is effective because if plenitude and Platonism is true, or if it were true, um, you know, um, regardless whether it's true, I guess, because you could say these other things, but um, there's always going to be some mathematical structure or entities or descriptions that um, could be used to talk about or model the world because no matter which way the world was, because there's all this, because the plenitudinous is, have used true, something like that. Um, is that more or less what you were, yeah. what you'd say on that? Yeah, that's, that's my view. I, I said this in my first book on the philosophy of math, but yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about this and I was thinking um, that there's at least two 
remaining facts uh, that someone might think are surprising um, about their effectiveness. Um, so one, okay, it's not just that mathematics is effective for, for describing the world or modeling the world in certain ways, but that it's like so remarkably effective in the way that it is. Um, so um, I, I guess you could imagine a world at which um, is maybe less amenable to mathematics description, even though it is because there's all the mathematical structures um, that, you know, and some of those are gonna be applicable to that world, but it's just like more of them and more complex ones and, and so on are, are applicable to the actual world. And that might be surprising. I mean, does that make sense? Or what, what do you think about that? I, I mean, I think that those worlds would be worlds that were very unregular and very non-structured and just sort of like weirdly a more, and then there were just like, there were not really any laws of nature and just everything like then it'd be like yeah mathematics is not gonna be much help because there's no good theorizing to do um but like as long as the world has regularity in it and structure in it like you know so um we go like here's just like a very trivial case like um i've got a bunch of sheep and i'm i'm counting them because blah 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 i'm like i need to sell them whatever and then like you like are, are a baker and you like bake and you need to like keep track and so you're counting He's saying, and then some genius mathematicians like, I got an idea. I'm going to abstract away and like I'll develop this number system zero, one, two, three. And like he's doing this because we, because of our need to like count sheep and biscuits. And then somebody comes and then we start, he develops it and he publishes and go, look, it's numbers. And then the baker goes, oh, I'm going to use this. And the, and the shepherd goes, oh, I'm going to use this. And then somebody comes along and go, what a miracle that the, the mathematical realm, like it's no miracle at all. It's like, that's why we developed it is to do this. And like, sometimes there are these weird coincidences where a theory is developed for one reason and then it's applicable for another. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. But like the very idea that math would be useful, it's like, no, that's why we developed the math is to do that. And if the world would have been different, the mathematician would have looked at that and gone, oh, I'll develop this math. And it would have been slightly different math to model that slightly different physical reality. And it wouldn't have been a miracle there either. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so there's something almost anthropic about this reasoning, which is that, um, or you, what you said at first, at least, which was that, um, you know, any world which is um, complex enough um, and perhaps stable and consistent enough to sustain creatures like us, that's going to be a, a world which is um, amenable to fairly complex mathematical description. Um, it's not a world of chaos um, where there's perhaps less um, applicability of, of, of um, mathematics. Maybe, maybe that's part of the idea. Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of the idea. Yeah, okay. And then, and then the second um, thing that someone might think is still a surprising fact about the effectiveness of mathematics is that um, has to do with the um, sort of order of uh, the development of mathematics, which is that some of, and perhaps a fair amount of the mathematics we developed wasn't initially developed in a, you know, this kind of problem solving kind of way, uh, like counting sheep, that sort of problem solving at least, but it was later found to be remarkably useful for describing or modeling the world. And that might be kind of surprising, um, because like, why would it, why would it be that um, these, this mathematical discourse that we developed, um, to a significant degree, independently of what the facts were, later became to be um, useful for modeling or describing the world? If that makes sense. Yeah. No, I think that is, that is a cool thing that requires explanation, and I don't have an explanation of it. I took that not to be the question about. That like Wigner is asked talking about when he talks about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. He's just talking about the general phenomenon. Why is mathematics useful at all? And that what I, that's what I think is like explained by what I was saying before. But why is it that Hilbert came up with Hilbert spaces and without knowing about quantum mechanics, and then later it was used in quantum mechanics? Like, what's up with that? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I I don't know enough about Hilbert's psychology and what his motives were and the connection to that. Maybe in the end it's a weird coincidence, or maybe there's like a story to tell, but like I don't know. 
in that like local case what the explanation is. But I agree with you that it's like, oh, that like calls out for some kind of explanation. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah, but that, um, yeah, that's interesting, I guess. But then, okay, so now let's um, turn briefly, I think, to um, composition there. And I think this is a bit more, potentially even more controversial than some of the stuff you say on um, mathematics, which is that, yeah, there's, um, whether there are composite objects, objects that have like proper parts, um, there's just, that's another question for which there's no fact of the matter. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe you wanna uh, just talk briefly about that and, and how, how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, so there's this, like, here's a view that like, and we were talking about this before, that um, there's just a bunch of tiny little simples. By a simple, I mean an object that doesn't have proper parts. And that's it. There's no, there's no objects made of them. So like here, this isn't a cup. This is just a bunch of simples arranged cup-wise. And I'm not a person. I'm just a bunch of simples arranged person-wise and so on. Um, so that call that view nihilism. I mean, it's not strictly right, but it's the, what that really is, is atomistic nihilism, but call it nihilism. And then there's another view that like, no, all those little particles exist, but then there's also big objects that are made of them. So the cup exists and it just has the particles as its parts. And so these two metaphysicians are arguing about whether composite objects like cups and tables exist. And what I think is that it's super unclear what they're even talking about. Um, and just to like go to the same kind of case I was talking about before. Like, so I, I again, so again, the argument is like, if we assume there's a fact of the matter here, then it's either gotta be a necessary fact or a contingent fact. And I think the necessary view doesn't work for the reason similar to what I was saying in the abstract object case, but the contingent case is like, okay, so we're supposed to imagine that there's two worlds, so they could have existed or not. And now we're supposed to imagine there are two worlds that are like identical at the micro level. So all the same simples exist. Um, and then somehow on, in one world, somehow on top of the simples arranged cup wise, there's a cup. And in the other world, there isn't. But they look exactly the same. Like the particles are arranged cup wise in both worlds. And then we've just got this extra object like smashed in there, but it's like invisible to us. Like we have the same retinal stimulations, like light, Light bounces off the simples and into my eye the same way it bounces if the cup is there. Like, this is kind of what I was saying before about the composite objects being causally irrelevant. So it looks the same. The two worlds look identical. No matter how close we look, no matter how deep down we go, the laws are the same. They look like, like if you were up above them, there'd be like, you'd be looking at like two machines and they would look like identical. And yet there's supposed to be this extra thing in the one world and not the other. I'm like, okay. I get back to the abstract object case, I don't get it. I have no idea what's being said of the one world and not the other. And so I just think like they failed to pick out truth conditions for this. And so it's just factually empty, indeterminate, imprecise, indeterminate, and there's no fact of the matter. Does that make sense? Yeah, somewhat. I guess I'm sort of sympathetic. I guess, um, I don't know, the way I might think about it, in those two worlds that you're thinking about, um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, in the first one, um, there's a cup there because I don't know. We have this word "cup," and there's this thing in our experience or whatever that we're counting as a cup, and the same sort of thing exists in the other world. So there would be a cup in the other world too. I don't, not sure. Okay. You why this has to say something so very substantive about meteorology, except to say that what we're counting as cups do admit to like descriptions in terms of parts or something like that, like, you know. So it may be that we use the word cup so that whether there's an extra object there or not, this counts as a cup. So the sentence, there's a cup in Mark's hand is true, right. regardless of whether there's really just simples and not an extra thing. Uh, in, in which case, I want to go. Oh, that, that's fine. So, in English, the sentence "There's a cup, some, cup in Mark's hand" is true. But now I want to introduce 
But now what you just did was sort of trivialize the dispute. Hmm. So there's a dispute between like famous philosophers, like David Lewis thinks there's a cup here and Van Inwagen thinks there isn't and they're arguing. And you just trivialize the dispute. You're just like, oh, if you just know what cup means in English, you're done. And they're like, no, but we want to know what the world is like. We're arguing about whether there's actually an extra object there. So now let's move to a different language, call it like English star. And then in English star, in order for there's a cup in Mark's hand to be true, there has to be an extra object over and above the simples that's numerically distinct from the simples. So like if there's a hundred simples here, obviously there's more than that, but if there's a hundred simples, there has to actually be 101 objects there for the sentence, there's a cup in Mark's hand to be true. There's gotta be this extra metaphysical thing. And Lewis is like, I believe there is an extra metaphysical thing. And Van Inwagen is like, there isn't. And they're arguing about whether the extra metaphysical thing is there. And now in that dispute, it seems to me that like, the point you want to make that like, oh, we just use the word cup so that it's true is like now irrelevant because I like moved to this new language in which I'm stipulating that like, we're talking about the existence of cup stars where a cup star is this thing that's numerically distinct from the simples. And so what I want to say is like, you might be right about the English, but I'm what I'm saying, there's no fact of the matter whether there are cup stars because it's totally unclear what it would even mean for there to be an extra thing there. Does that make sense? Actually, I think it. I think it does. So if you're talking about um, in this in this way of um, thinking about things, under which uh, there's at least an apparently substantive dispute between nihilists and non-nihilists. Um, yeah, probably would come out. I, I can't just give my response because that assumes a understanding of the language in which that isn't an even apparently substantive dispute, maybe. Um, maybe some of that's going on. I guess I did also want to add, um, and I'm, yeah, might, that might turn, the non-factualist response might be right there, I'm not sure. But the other thing I want to add is that, and this is something that seems to be presupposed in a lot of these disputes is that, um, and this might be just me retreating to my my preferred sort of language. I don't get it when people say, oh, there's definitely simples. And there's this question of whether they compose, um, uh, there are objects composed of them. Okay, well, no, I think, I mean, I think there's definitely cups. Uh, you know, what's the reason for privileging symbols? I mean, maybe it's a question of whether there are symbols. Um, and not just to say whether there's, the world is gunk or something like that. Um, you know, the, there might be a question of whether those are genuine, like there might be a question of whether those are genuine objects. Well, I mean, we have a word for them, I guess. Um, we, have, do we have a word for the cups and those things we're counting as cups. I mean, I guess what I'm getting at here is this might be going back to the trivial thing again, but um, I don't get this privileging of, in our description of like ontology, the simples, because um, the knowledge wants to say, Oh, regardless of whether there are these composite objects, there's definitely simples, uh, assuming the world isn't gunky. Um, I, I don't, that seems like kind of unmotivated to me, if that makes sense. I, I totally agree with everything you said, and I don't think you're going back to the trivialist thing. So here's a view held by Terry Horgan. There's just one object. There's one physical object, namely the universe, or as he calls it, the blobject. And it has no parts. So if nihilism is the view that there are no composite objects, then there are two kinds of nihilist views. One is the um, one is the atomistic nihilist view that says there's a bunch of little simples and nothing composed of them. And one that says there's just a universe and it has no parts. Now, notice that those two views, and now we can throw in the Lewis view that like they're the simples and then there are also objects made of them. But those views, don't, there's not a single object there that is agreed to exist by all three people, right? So my friend Chris McDaniel calls this those three views the triangle of pain because like you can't even there's no object that you can agree on exists, and um, uh, so I totally agree we shouldn't privilege those. I set up the argument in the book privileging them just to get the argument going, but then I kick that away at the end. And what I think is like, 
there's no facts of the matter about any of this stuff. Like the world is not carved into objects. Like that's roughly my view. The physical world is not, does not come carved into objects. One way to carve it into objects is to say, there's just a bunch of little symbols and nothing else. Another way is to say, there's a bunch of symbols plus objects made of them. Another way to do it is to say, there's a universe and nothing else. But none of them, there's no fact of the matter about any of them, because now we can line up three possible worlds and run the exact same argument again. And so now we, we don't get out of it, well, simple, at least simple success. Rather, we get out of it, there's no object for which there's a fact of the matter whether that one exists. And all we can do is like pick a fiction about how to carve it into objects and then go with it and talk in those ways and then argue that our sentences are fact true. And it'll be like, what that means is that the counterfactual is true. Assuming the fiction that you're working with then state your theory. Does that make yeah, sense? That, that's, that makes a lot. It's very close to like my views on the matter. Like, although, um, do we, would we have, and this might, okay, this might come back to how we're understanding the, the sort of carvings up and the theories that we're endorsing. Um, if when someone says, okay, there are atoms, or this is my theory, well, there are atoms and I could maybe compose things. If they're saying the truth of that is some like strong metaphysical truth in the sense that that's really the way it is and these other um, models like the nihilist view or the um, like priority monus view, whatever, and those are really false. Um, then um, I'm gonna agree with the non-factualist response. That doesn't make any sense. Um, however, um, if you could use this language and use these like theories in a way that doesn't commit yourself to that, which is just to say, look, I've developed these concepts. I'm applying them in these ways that are true in the way that I'm understanding the concepts. Um, it's true that someone could carve things up a different way and the way that they're carving them up, the statements they make might be true, but none of them are like these different ways of carving them up aren't at odds in principle with the other ways. It's not like I'm saying theirs is like false, right? There's just not using the same concepts and uh, ways of talking that I am or something like that. And then you don't need to go non-factualism. You can just go some sort of conceptual pluralism or something like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's basically a Carnap view. Like mm -hmm. yeah. no matter how you set it up, you'll get a true theory. I don't think you can have your cake and eat it too. I think that, um, as soon as you set up your concept, you're like, they're saying things. They're saying things like they're, so if you take the Lewis way of setting it up where there's a bunch of symbols plus everything made of them, you're saying things like there are symbols and there are objects made of them. And if the world is not carved into objects then you're saying things that aren't true. You can't just like set up your rules and go, therefore it's true by stipulation, which is the way it seems like Carnap wants to go. You can do that if you switch to a trivialist language where you're like, I'm not really saying that that's, there really are symbols and things made of it. And, but then you're trivializing the debate. So like, if you, um, the, the metaphys, I, I mean, I like the metaphysical debate about whether these things are really there. I think you're saying like, yeah, I think I'd go non-factualist about that like you. So like, I don't wanna, I think we agree about that. But like, when you introduce this language, if you're speaking at all in the way that we normally speak, it seems to me that you're, saying things like there are symbols, there are things composed of them and our normal way of speaking. And so it's strictly speaking false. And I think the right way to think of it is it's fap true. And if you set up a different language where you're like, no, I'm going to stipulate that I'm not saying that, then what you've got is like a trivialist language. And I, I agree, you can do that, but you're going to have sentences that are very misleading. You're going to be saying things like there are cups and it's going to come out true in your sentence, in your language but only because it doesn't say what it feels like it says. If it says what it feels like it says, it's not true if the world isn't carved into objects because there aren't cups. If, if the sentence means what it feels like it means in normal English and the world isn't carved into objects, then it's just a fiction that there are cups. It's a useful fiction and it's fine. And the sentences come out fab true. I just don't think they can come out true unless the sentences don't say at all what they seem to say. Yeah, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Although I think, to be honest, um, the way I understand this, 
like the way I use the terms, maybe just is this kind of trivia language. I don't, I have, as far as I can remember, um, don't really have this intuition that the world comes carved up, carved up in some way. I don't, in fact, I'm not even, that's almost kind of mysterious to me what that would mean. Um, and I don't think the way that I'm talking, typically anyway, um, involves a commitment to being pre-carved up in some way or not. So like, it might be that the way I'm using it at least, and I don't know how common this, this sentiment is, is already this kind of trivialist language that you want to, you're talking about, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, th I, I think that we're now pretty much agreeing and we're maybe I disagreeing. So. I don't even think, I was going to say, maybe we're disagreeing about what the sentences mean in folk English, but you don't even seem to be committing to that. So I think we're not even disagreeing about that. You're just like, here's what I mean. And I'm like, okay, if you mean that, great. And then your sentences are, when you say there are cups, then I think in your language, it's true. I have doubts about whether you're speaking English, um, but that yeah. sort of doesn't really matter here. And like, even if I'm wrong, like that's just a disagreement about what ordinary folk mean by there are cups. So yeah, it's just some empirical like, question. Yeah. yeah, and I think we're pretty much agreeing that if we're speaking a thick language, it's factually empty. We could define this thin language if we wanted, it would be true. We can also define this other sort of thick language and say it's strictly speaking false, but it's fap true. Like, I think we're agreeing on all of that. And so, yeah. Yeah. I'm totally on board with that. I think that's I think that's right. And uh, you know, which language I'm speaking, which language um, people generally are speaking, that's some empirical question. But we could agree on all the specific cases. I think for all the like the usages or the languages that we might be speaking, what the facts are, so to speak. Um, I think yeah, I think I'm totally on board with all that. To be honest, it's pretty good stuff. Um. Yeah, so I, I did want to turn to, and this is something you mentioned at the beginning, um, that one of the kind of, maybe you used the word like loose ends or something that you, you want to cover is the modal stuff, right? Um, metaphysical possibility, necessity, um, what could be, what, um, um, and so on, or what has to be, those, those sorts of things. Because, and this is like the worry that um, you want to preempt, if you're a non-factualist about um, abstract objects, and you're not, you also don't think you know this. You're not a modal realist as well. Um, how are we assessing these modal claims? What does it mean? What it was required for them to be true, and so on? If not certain facts about sets of sentences or other concrete possible worlds or something else like that, um, how are we assessing the? How could you even have these, this modal discourse? You develop this nothingism view. I, I don't know. Do you want to do you want to talk about how um, you address that? Yeah, I can say. So when you say these modal claims, do you mean the counterfactuals that we've been talking about? Yeah, sure. Yeah, especially those. So like, if there if there had been the Platonic uh, Platonic realm, then you know these mathematical statements would have been true. I guess that sort of thing. Right. right. So let, let's put those on the back burner and focus on like very simple modal sentences first, like there could have been flying saucers is the one that I talk about in the book a lot. Um, so what I argue, and I, I'm not gonna claim this is true of all modal claims, what I argue is that there's a certain set of modal sentences. And in particular, I, I'm thinking mostly of sentences that are analytic. Like um, if Mars had had exactly three moons, then it would have had more than two moons or something like that. I'm like, that's analytic. I also think that there could have been flying saucers is analytic. If you know what could means and you know what flying saucers mean, it's analytic. In any event, here's my claim is that we can develop a language, forget about English for a minute. We can develop a language and you can imagine a community of speakers this, this way that they tell it, like, I'm going to tell you how we use this word could. When we say there could have been flying saucers, we're not saying anything about reality. We're, we're not not saying that there's another world where there are flying saucers. We're not saying anything. We're not saying that the stuff that actually exists could have been organized into a flying saucer. We're just making a pure could claim. We're not saying anything about how things are. We're just saying something about how things could have been. There could have been flying saucers. And so in the book, I argue that we can coherently develop a language like this. And that um, if we do, some of the sentences in the language are going to come out true. 
And here's the, the really interesting thing, I argue that for some of these sentences, they're true and nothing makes them true. So I reject in the book, um, truth-making principles that are pretty widely accepted that every truth needs a truth maker. Um, uh, what I argue is that in the case of these certain kinds of modal sentences, namely analytic ones, they can be true and nothing makes them true. And then I argue that like the counterfactual, if plenitudinous Platonism had been true, then three would have been prime is in fact analytic. Um, and so it's, I get to say it's true and I don't, it doesn't commit me to anything about reality. And then in connection with the other kinds of counterfactuals, like if atomism and universalism had been true, then Mars would have been a planet. I, that's not analytic. And so I can't say that it's made true by nothing, but I have this sort of slightly more complicated view that it, it's made true partly by the fact, by facts about like the matter in our solar system in the Marsy region, the Marsy matter in our solar system and partly by nothing. So there's like a pure modal part of it that's made true by nothing. And then there's this empirical part that's made true by empirical facts. So that, that's like roughly the view that I go for. Yeah, very good. Uh, so like um, when you talk about the possibility of there being flying saucers um, as being in a way like almost analytically true, um, I, can you kind of expand on that? Like in which way is that analytically true? I mean. Um, that seems to be like, we I mean, might want to say that it's true, um, but which well, is an analytic. Yeah. So imagine that we're using, I think that po the word possible and also words like could um, can pick out different kinds of possibility, right? So there's physical possibility and conceptual possibility and logical possibility. And there's a broadest kind of possibility that roughly that I'm glossing over, I don't think this is exactly right, but glossing over some details, anything that's not contradictory is possible. Um, now, if you grasp that broadest notion of possibility, um, like roughly it corresponds to truth in all Lewisian worlds, it's not exactly right, but like they're gonna be like coextensive. But if you, if you, if you grasp this broadest notion of possibility that basically means something like non-contradictory, then the meaning of that term, and then you also know what like flying saucer means. And there are like, it's just, it falls out of the meanings of all of the words that like, oh, that's true, right? Cause there's not a con that the sentence, there are um, flying saucers doesn't lead to contradiction. And so if all that's needed for this broadest kind of possibility is non-contradiction, then it, you got it. And we got that just by like knowing what the words mean. So that's why I think like that's analytic. It requires hearing the word could have as picking out this broadest kind of possibility. If you're picking out a narrower kind of possibility, then I think it's not analytic. Uh, right. Um... How is this not then kind of identifying um, Lewisian worlds, metaphysically possible worlds, with, I don't know, something more like the logically possible worlds? So, like, for example, take the um, gold is, is atomic number 79, or water is H2O. Presumably, um, those aren't logical truths. Um, but, like, we want to say, or people like Lewis, um, or people that are engaged in this sort of theory, as typically want to say, they're metaphysically necessary. Um, uh, so uh, they wouldn't be analytic then, right? Or, or, or would right. they? Yeah, no, water is H2O, it's not analytic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I mean, I, I, on my way of thinking about this stuff, like, I don't think logical possibility is a genuine kind of possibility. Like there are married bachelors and there's non H2O water. Those sentences are logically possible, but they're not, po they're just straight up impossible, right? It, there, there couldn't be married bachelors and there couldn't be non H2O water. Um, but I don't think that um, all, 
all water is H2O is analytic. Uh, I, so I, I don't have a nothingness view of that sentence. Um, but I think that there could have been flying saucers is analytic. So. But it sounded like it was analytic because it didn't involve a contradiction. Yeah. But then we can say the same thing about the water case, right? It doesn't but, involve a contradiction. Suppose that water is not H2O. You see what I'm saying? Like, I'm not sure. But what's the What's the sentence? So, like, are you saying there could have been non H two O water? Sure. Yeah, it's, it takes something like that. So, like, yeah, should I, like that's not analytically false, um, but it's metaphysically impossible, right? Or and then like, so what's the gap? Like, how are we bridging? Like, what's the difference between that and the one where we say? Um, uh the flying saucer case um it's not analytically true that there are or, or that there aren't flying saucers um but it's um well maybe you want to say that it is analytically true or false uh, true that there could be flying saucers but it's not like um uh, a contradiction or something to suppose that uh I don't know, maybe I'm not expressing this very well, but um, so, I guess when, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm I, th I, I see what you're sort of reaching for, but mm -hmm. I'm not, and, and if I knew, I, I have no problem with like helping you ask the question. I'm <laughs> yeah. not, I'm not getting at that clearly. So like, I, I don't think that all could have claims. I don't think all sentences of the form, it could have been that P are analytic. Um, I think only some of them are. Um, and I don't think that there's an analytic tie between water and H2O. Um, so I think that um, you can't derive from, from knowing what the, the words in the sentence mean, you can't derive that there's that non H2O water is impossible. You have to know that the actual water is made of H2O. And then you, then you have the meaning fact that water is a rigid designator. And like, so you, once you, from, from meaning facts together with the, the non-meaning fact that actual water is made of H2O, you can derive the impossibility because there's a meaning fact that water is a rigid designator. Uh, uh, is that maybe what makes a difference between this case and the flying saucer case? Because that one doesn't involve some um, like empirical claim or rigid designator claim. Yeah, there are no rigid designators in that. And like in the book, like some of the ways I articulate these, if the, like the principle that I said, like the non-contradictory thing, I think there's a clause in there about there's no rigid designators in there. And then I think there's a footnote if I'm remembering right. I had any right wrote a footnote. I might have ended up cutting it out, but I was like, if there is a rigid designator, we're gonna that everything changes and you need a different principle. Um and because we don't want, you know, we don't want to like forget about sentences like that. But like, uh, yeah, that's that's a sort of proviso uh, principle. Okay, that makes sense. So that's gonna that's gonna break the symmetry that I was worried about, but poorly articulating between the flying saucer case and the, you know, gold or water, or other sorts of things like that case, because the yeah. latter have these rigid designators, and then you can't. Um, the the fact that it, there's no contradiction involved in the statement won't entail the metaphysical possibility. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think if I'm recalling right, there's just in, straight in that principle, there's a clause about there being no rigid designator. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I don't. You're probably right. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't recall. But yeah, you're probably right. Um, yeah. So then also, I'm talking about modality. Um, you seem to commit to there being um sort of like basic modal truths um how are you understanding that really um is it just the sort of things you're talking about in terms of like logic or something like that or or, or something else yeah i mean i think they'll be they'll some of them will sound like logical truths but i'm thinking of things like the thing i just said about like possibility being linked to non-contradictoriness and so also like there couldn't be any true contradictions. 
And my thought is there's some subset, there's some small set of these basic truths that then we can use to derive all of the other analytic truths. So we're not going to, from them, we're not going to derive that non-H2O water is impossible, but I think we can derive for analytic sentences, like there could have been flying saucers, and if Mars had had three moons, then it would have had more than two moons. I think the, the analytic ones will be able to derive them from these basic modal truths, and then so we'll have an explanation of why they're true, and then the only ones that we'll have to say are brute is this small set of basic truths. So we'll have to say, like, it's a brute fact that there couldn't be any true contradictions, but we won't have to say it's a brute fact that there could have been flying saucers. And so it seems like, oh, that's not that bad. We all kind of have to say that it's brute that there couldn't be any true contradictions. It's hard to get any, like, it's hard to get in an explanatory way below that. Like that just seems bedrock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. So when you, when you say it's like brute, um, it sounds, when I read this part, of it's, it felt like you were committing to, um, well, it's, it's, it really is like a sort of substantive modal fact, but it's not something that we can explain in any other basic terms. Um, but it's also not like a matter of stipulation or convention or something like that. Right. Um, I do think it's analytic. Yeah. I think like it's analytic that there couldn't be true contradictions, but I also think it's like a substantive truth in a way. And like, it's not just, it's not just a convention, but given what the words mean, given what contradiction all the words mean, it follows that there couldn't be any true contradictions, but I don't think it's convention. I don't think our conventions like make anything true. The only thing right. they make true is sentence claims about what our sentences mean. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean that, but the fact that it's analytic has something to do with what the sentences mean. Right. And that's, has to of do course. with conventions. Right. Of course. And it also has to do with how we know it. Like, you might think that the fact that it's analytic helps us be confident that it's true. Um, but I don't think that's what makes it true. Like, I think it's brute. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to see the light between this and a somewhat conventionalist or quasi-conventionalist view where um, we start with um, um, we do mean certain things by um, like necessary. And, and one of the things that's going to fall out of what we mean by necessary and so on is that, um, you know, a tautology is necessary or a, yeah. a logical contradiction is impossible. That's just going to follow what we mean. In a way, it's sort of fixed by our conventions of the, this like talk that we're engaged in. Um, and that's, sort of a fact about our conventions, but um, so, I, I don't know, so, yeah. I, I think it's important to distinguish here between following, like logically following and truth making. So take the sentence, all bachelors, or actually let's switch to this one. Take the sentence, um, snow is white or it's not the case that snow is white. Um, I think that's analytic. It's logically true also, but it's analytic. And what I mean when I say it's analytic is that it follows from true claims about what the words in the sentence mean. So if, if just from knowing what the words mean, you can see, you can deduce that it's true. But I don't think that facts about meaning make the sentence true. Like all the facts about meaning, facts about our conventions make it the case that the sentence snow is white or it's not the case that snow is white means that snow is white or it's not the case that snow is white. But they don't make it the case that that proposition is true. What makes, what's the truth maker of that proposition? What makes it the case that the proposition is true? And the answer is, well, because snow is white. Um, that's what makes it true. Now, if snow hadn't been white, that proposition still would have been true. It would have been made true by the fact that snow isn't white. But what I think is that like analytic disjunction, sentences of the form P or not P, are made, even if they're analytic, they're made true not by facts about meaning, but by facts about the world. They're made true by whatever makes the true disjunct true. So snow is white, or it's not the case that snow is white, is made true by the very same thing that makes true the 
sentence snow is white or the moon is made of green cheese. It's like one of the disjuncts is true. That's what's making it true. Um, and I don't think our conventions ever make true. Now, from meaning, you can deduce that a sentence is true, but that's not what's making the sentence true. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK, yeah. So you're drawing the distinction between something making a sentence true and it, like it's truth following from certain yeah. facts about meaning. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. So <clears throat> but then in the case of um, uh, like the statement, um, necessarily there are no true contradictions um you know or necessarily not p and not p whatever um i guess you want to say okay nothing is making that true um but it's still made true by the world in some way um no i think it's not made true at all oh it's not made true at all I mean, but it's still true analytic it's true nothing makes it true it's analytic right. But analyticity never gives you a good truth-making story, ever. So it does follow from meaning, but the, for the reasons I just gave, it's not made true by facts about analyticity. It's not made true by anything. It just is true. Just like there could have been flying saucers. I think all of that about, that's analytic. It's true, nothing makes it true, but it's not brute because I can explain it by appealing to the basic modal truths. But then when we get to the basic modal truths, like there couldn't be any true contradictions. I have the same view. It's true. Nothing makes it true. Now I also have to say it's brute. But I feel like in that, in those cases, it's plausible that it's brute. Like nobody can explain, nobody can give a good explanation of why there couldn't be true contradictions. Yeah. Um, I, two, two things, I guess. First, um, I guess it's still just a bit mysterious to me what we're saying then with respect to the, at least the primitive ones perhaps the other ones as well, um, what we're saying when we're saying that they're true. Um, well, this I don't is, know, maybe, I, maybe I'm just don't really understand it, you know? I mean, this is the, I mean, I gave the argument. Yeah. I gave the argument in the book for it being true and it's a long argument, mm. um, but, you know, I, I, I can't go through the whole argument here, but it's like, there's a, there was like four arguments or something. One of them is that, um, uh, well, I mean, it's analytic and every sentence that's analytic is true. It follows from what the words in the sentence mean. That's one argument. But you the don't want to just say, you don't want to just say when we're saying that it's true, you know, it, all we're talking about is it following from these other things. Because I, like I can grant that, but presumably it's, you're, when you're saying that it's true, there's something else entailed but it's like primitive or there's no like other way to explain it and something like that and that's i mean if we just i mean here's another argument just assess the sentence so once you understand that the modal nothing is language where we're not saying anything about reality we're just saying there couldn't be true any, any true contradictions it's just it's just the negation of a pure cl could claim okay and now you if you understand that you might go i can't understand that and like there's another argument for that in the book that you should understand it. But if you understand it, now just assess the sentence from your stand, like from your by normal standards. So do you want to go, no, they're wrong when they say there couldn't be any true contradictions? And I go, well, if you say that, then you have to say there could have been true contradictions. And now maybe you've got priest's view, but I think you're not really, that's not where you're headed. You're like trying to, you've got some kind of truth making work. And I'm like, look, if I just assess, once I understand them, if I just assess the sentence, using my normal standards of evaluation, I'm just like, oh, that's, they got it right. There couldn't be any true contradictions. So that's like a second argument. Yeah, I'm, well, I can understand what we're saying, you know, when we say that there aren't any true contradictions. Um, but when, I don't know, certain ways that we use or might use modal language, um, where we say that there couldn't be true contradictions, when that become when that's intended as some sort of primitive notion, I, I'm not really I don't really I don't really understand it to be honest, and like one way I like to think about um, like modality is that um, well we have these like formal systems maybe 
Um, we have certain axioms. We have um, uh, like um, formula, well-formed formula construction rules and certain operators and inference rules. And those, you can include those in the axioms if you want. And, um, you know, we can conduct, and in and, and modality, you're, importantly, two of the operators you're going to have are necessity and possibility operator, and then kind of other things. And, um, you know, logical modality, you're going to include certain logical principles as your axioms, something nomological, okay, you might want to tie those to potentially discovered facts about um, the way that the world evolves and something like that. Um, and um, something metaphysical or conceptual. Okay, maybe we want to build in certain conceptual truths into our axioms. Um, maybe rigid designation uh, uh, um, facts. We want to include those in the axioms. You know, even if we don't know what they are, they're like we're stipulating that those are included. I, I can understand if this sort of approach kind of makes sense. Um, I can understand it because whenever you're making a claim with respect to one of these modalities. And really, any modality that uh, involves truths as axioms, things that I think are true of the actual world as axioms, are like fine to me, um, as long as I accept those truths and the inference rules. Um, you know, is this a sort of conventionalism? I don't know. Like, um, does does that kind of approach make any sense to you, or have I, mean, I not? Yeah, for sure. I like. I think I pretty much understood what you're saying. It's like not. The view that i'm going for here right right right, right. and like if you I mean, but it makes sense and like if you are like i just don't understand this like primitive could thing you've got then i'm like okay i feel like i understand that i feel like most people do but i i kind of feel like maybe you're not alone and maybe like the that's the right way to understand people like quine and cider who are like super anti very deflationary about modality like maybe they're just like yeah i don't think i don't know if cider would put it that way but like i think quine might be like yeah i don't understand this i think cider maybe wouldn't put it that way but he just kind of thinks like there's not really any facts about cause could have and must have in the world um yeah maybe, maybe what you're saying is like similar to that but like to me like I feel like I understand primitive possibility and I feel like, oh yeah, there couldn't be any true contradictions. That's right. And then I go, what's it about? I'm like, I'm not saying anything about what is. I'm just telling you something about what couldn't be. There couldn't be any true contradictions. And it just seems right. But like, if you're just like, sorry, I don't understand it. I'm like, I'm not sure what I can say to make you understand it. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I totally um, I'm totally sympathetic to that. I, I think, and yeah, you mentioned cider. Some of the things I'm saying are definitely at least inspired by cider. Um, uh, yeah, it might be that you and maybe a lot of people um, do understand the primitive notion of possibility and necessity or have some primitive notion that you're using that word to express. Um, and I just don't get it, or maybe I have the concept but don't I, I haven't associated with the the words you're expressing um but yeah uh, supposing you do have it um or people do have it that maybe it is the right thing to say um what do you say about it uh, just like for me it's like i have these other diff kind of deflationary um ways of understanding the terms that like make sense to me and that's how i like to use them um but yeah People could have some other concepts, perhaps primitive modal concepts that um, they can put to work in the ways that you and many other people tend to talk about. But yeah, I can't, like, I, you know, I struggle with that. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, we all do. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, so I don't want to keep you forever. So I do want to kind of give a, a kind of a couple of wrapping up questions. Um, although I think probably would be important to. And this is something kind of introduced, we sort of introduced at the beginning um, on the general kind of worldview that you develop here, this neo-positivism. Um, how, how would you kind of sort of summarize that view and, and, um, um, and also like how it's different from 
Um, was this something you talked about already? How it's different from like pos like old school positivists, um, like logical positivists? No, I don't think we touched on that. Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess what I want to say is it's not really a view of the world. It's a view of metaphysics and maybe parts of philosophy that go beyond metaphysics. And it's, it's a view of the nature of certain kinds of metaphysical questions or basically all metaphysical questions. And so roughly the view is if you have a metaphysical question, all metaphysical questions can be decomposed into sort of more basic questions. And then of those basic metaphysical questions, the overall view is right. And I'm just going to like skip. I mean, roughly it's a three-way distinction that like once you decompose the questions, um, we can endorse one of three anti-metaphysical views. One is non-factualism. There's no fact of the matter. The other is scientism, which roughly not exactly is the view that it's just an ordinary empirical question about the nature of the physical world. It's contingent. And there's no way to settle it with a priori arguments. And the third one is this view that I call metaphysically innocent modal truthism, which roughly is the view that the questions about the truth value of a modal sentence that if true is analytic and about which we can endorse my view modal nothingism. So roughly the sentence doesn't say anything about reality and it's not made true by reality. But like the, the simpler version of this, like glossing over details is that every metaphysical question decomposes into questions about which we can either endorse scientism or non-factualism. So the questions are either just ordinary scientific questions or they're non-factual. And um, roughly the decomposition goes, um, the decomposition goes, there's like metaphysical questions usually decompose into two basic questions. One is a conceptual analysis question like, if we're, you know, if the question is, are there any numbers? The question is, what is a number? And if the question is, do we have free will? The question is, what is free will? Um, and I argue that those conceptual analysis questions are settled by empirical facts about what we mean by the given words. And so um, we can endorse scientism about that question. And Right? So it's just a, an empirical fact about us that we mean by the following thing, by free will. Um, but also what follows from that view is that the conceptual analysis question isn't really metaphysically interesting. It's just a question about words. And the metaphysically interesting question, that, and this is the other question that the original metaphysical de question decomposes into, is a question that doesn't use the folk term free will or number. And asks about the nature of reality. So this is the metaphysical question. It asks about the nature of reality using stipulated words with stipulated meaning. So like in the number case, the question would be, which kinds of number-like things are there? Are there Platonistic numbers? Are there Carnap numbers? And then are there like any way you want to think about numbers, throw that in there. And we just ask, which kinds of number-like things are there? And in the free will case, the question will be, which kinds of freedom-like abilities do we have? Do we have Hume freedom? Do we have libertarian freedom? Do we have Frankfurt freedom? Do we have Strassen freedom? And any kind of freedom you might have in mind, give, a, give us a precise definition and we'll throw that in there. This is the question that's about the nature of the world and it's the metaphysical question that we should be thinking about. And so the neo-positivist has to argue that each one of those questions, neo-positivism is true of it. Um, and what I argue in the book is that most of these questions can be swept away as trivial. Like, are there any Carnap numbers? Yeah, because that doesn't require anything of the world. Do we have Hume freedom? Yeah, because that's tr empirically trivial. That's just basically being able to act on your desires. We know we have that. So what we're left with is these sort of like thick metaphysical questions. Are there any Platonistic numbers? Um, do we have libertarian freedom? Are there non-natural moral facts? Are there composite objects that are like metaphysically substantive in the way that we were talking about earlier. The hard part of neopositivism is arguing that each one of those questions is either a factually empty question, there's no fact of the matter, or it's just an empirical question, right? So in this book, I argue for a non-factualist view of the composite object question and the um, abstract object question. And at the end, I sort of wave my hands at, um, 
how you could argue for neo-positivism about some other questions. So like I have a previous book where I argue that the question of whether we have libertarian free will is an empirical question. It's just a straight up empirical question. Um, and I think like the hard part of neo-positivism is arguing for each one of these questions that either we should be non-factualist or we should be think that it's just an empirical scientific question. Okay, so that's roughly the view and it's like a research program and that's how you argue for it. But the answer, like I've set myself up to answer your other question, how does this view differ from old style positivism? And here's how, the view is not self-refuting because if we ask the question, is this kind of neo-positivism true? My, I endorse a scientific view of that. That's just an empirical question because it's neo-positivism is just a claim about a certain finite cluster of actual questions discussed by real people. And I just gave you the list of, you know, there's more than that, but it's not like, it's just about the real questions of metaphysics. And I'm making an empirical claim that for each one of those questions, once we do this like decomposition and we're left with these thick metaphysical questions, in each case, we're either going to be able to endorse scientism or non-factualism. And so I endorse scientism of the question of whether this is true, because it's an empirical claim about these real questions discussed by real people. So that's the sort of overall project. Um, and that's why it's different from the original version of positivism. It's not self-refuting. Oh, and also I'm not a verificationist, right? I think that all of these all of the theories and all of these questions are meaningful. Yeah, very, very good. And like, and like you talk about how you can maybe su support it, um, the new positivism kind of like inductively, like if you, in principle, if you went through a bunch of them, you know, you could, well, that's a good reason to think that probably all these sorts of questions fall under that. Yeah. So rubric. if I go through 10 of them, and I argue for neo-positivism about 10 of these questions, then we can go, oh, it's probably true of all metaphysical questions. So that's just adding more grist to the mill that like, this is just a scientific question. Right. Um, okay, I did think of something that I really wanted to ask about the modality thing. So I'm sorry to jump back, but I, I thought it was, um, because I, I've talked with people who um, are like sympathetic at least to the view that, um, the metaphysically possible worlds are um, like share a starting point. Like every metaphysically possible world is a evolves from um, some initial state. Um, I don't know if this is kind of like Aristotelian, but anyway, I don't know if um, Graham Oppie has this, this sort of view. Uh, I've talked with like Alex Malpass, he's sympathetic to this. Other people um, find this somewhat plausible. Now, the worry I have, um, Maybe this kind of worry, I, I feel like this worry is kind of reasonable given some of the views you've discussed in this book. It's like, well, like there should be some sort of substantive, substantive dispute here between the person who says all metaphysically possible worlds share this origin and someone who says, no, 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 there's different metaphysically possible starting points or maybe there is no starting point. Um, but like what, I don't know, like what would be different about the world if um, one of these theories was true and the other one not? Like, I, you know, um, is that really a substantive dispute or you kind of get the, the worry there? So I think, I don't know Graham Oppie's view, so I, I'm not 100% certain of what I'm about to say, but I think I'm good with this because I know of people that hold sort of similar kind of views. And so I'm gonna say what I say to them. Um, I think there's a sort of verbal dispute going on here caused by the fact that we're using metaphysically possible in different ways. I'm using it to mean the very broadest kind of possibility that roughly lines up with non-contradictoriness. I'm pretty sure that if, if what you're saying is right, that Graham Oppie is just like, yeah, that is definitely not what I'm, using it to mean, I'm using it to mean a, a much more substantive, a narrower kind of possibility. And it's also very worldly in a sense. So there, what's metaphysically possible and not is a worldly fact. Um, and I want, what I want to say is like, oh, okay. Teach me about what your word metaphysically possible means. 
by the way, we should have two different words. I'll, I'll give you metaphysically possible. I'll just use broadest possibility. And so I'm like, this world with a different start is broadly possible. That just means non-contradictory. I'll go native in your, in your language and you tell me what it means and I'll try to learn what it means. And then I can talk to you about what's metaphysically possible in your sense. Um, and I think it's going to be largely irrelevant to my thing because I'm just talking about a different kind of possibility. And I also suspect that once I learn what you mean, I'm going to be like probably going non-factualist about whether this is even a thing. Because I'm like, what kind of weird restrictions are you putting on the world to do this? Some versions of this, I think I won't be non-factualist. So Alistair Wilson has this view that roughly the many worlds of an Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics are the the modally different worlds. Um, and most people are like, oh no, that's two different things. He's like, no, it's the same thing. And so he's talking about a worldly kind of metaphysical possibility. And once I learn what he means, I'm like, oh, okay, I got it. I think Everett's wrong and that's not the right. So nothing's metaphysically possible in your sense, it's not actual. But if Everett's right, then it's just a straight up empirical question, what's metaphys, and now it's just like a scientific question, what's metaphysically possible in the Alistair Wilson sense. So I'd be a, I would just endorse scientism about all questions about what's metaphysically possible in Al Wilson's sense. But in, there might be other senses where it like narrows down and I'm like, I don't even get this and I might be non-factualist, but I would have to see the details of each definition of metaphysical possibility before I decided. But in all of these cases, I'd be like, oh, they're just using the word metaphysically possible different from how I'm using it because I'm just using it to mean broadest possibility. Right. I, I guess that that makes sense. I mean, I think in Hoppy's case and maybe some others, um, if you ask them to like, oh, can you give a further definition of how you're using it, they're, they're just going to say, oh, it's, it's like primitive. I, I don't know. This is, but this is the way I think metaphysical possibility is. Uh, like, that might be right. Objectively if, speaking. If I said, yeah. if I said, do you mean this? Um, it just lines up with non-contradictoriness. Don't I yeah, mean, they're I probably gonna, they're gonna have to say no, of course. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I don't know the details because I haven't read his stuff, but I what based on what you said, I think he's gonna go, oh no, not that. Right. <clears throat> but I think what he would say positively about it is not really much, because it's kind of primitive notion, even perhaps even more primitive than um how you're using it, if that makes sense. Yeah. But um yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We talked about free will. Yeah. Yeah. So just a quick thing on how this would be, because you've written on meta, meta ethics as well. So how, how would this um, sort of approach the methodology be applied to um, meta ethical questions or, or do you think that's an appropriate application of it? Yeah. So I think like, if, if my view is right, then, and we do this decomposition. So the first, so let's say we have a question like, um, let's say we're thinking about wrongness, moral wrongness. And so we want to know, like, are there any like wrongness facts in the world? Like, so it's like a question about moral realism versus anti-realism. And then the first question will be like, well, wait, what is wrongness? Right. So like in my decomposition, we get this question, what is moral wrongness? And then the answers are going to be like, well, Mill has the view that it's like utilitarian wrongness, like not maximizing, you know, whatever Mill says. Um, and then Kant has a different thing about what, you know, like treating somebody as a means rather than ends or whatever. So we'll have these different notions of Kant wrongness, Mill wrongness, Aristotle wrongness, whatever. Um, and then this whole normative ethical debate that's been going on for the last couple thousand years um, becomes like, if I'm right, becomes just like an empirical question about what we mean by the word wrong. And it's not really metaphysically interesting. The really metaphysically interesting question is which kinds of wrongness like facts are there? And <clears throat> are there mill wrong facts? Are there Kant wrong facts? Are there more wrong facts? And so on. And like, just like in the other cases, we can sweep a lot of these questions away as being trivial. Like, are there any mill wrong facts? Obviously, 
those are just empirical facts about what maximizes happiness or pleasure or you know however you define it um the only ones that are going to be left is going to be the question of whether they're non-natural moral facts um that's the metaphysical question buried in the buried in the question of whether like moral realism is true the metaphysically interesting question is whether they're non-natural moral facts i think that the like roughly I, i'm a non-factualist about that like it's unclear what this would even be and so it's like very similar to what i think about composite objects um you might think like this is running roughshod over morality what i think is like no what's left in all of this is applied ethical questions like the normative ethics just becomes like trivial semantics the the meta ethical question of realism becomes the question of whether there are non natural moral facts i'm a non factualist about that but what's left of morality is applied ethical questions like is it wrong to eat meat and i think that's a perfectly factual question if non naturalism is true then like it's not going to be the right answer isn't going to be strictly true but it's going to be true in the story of non natural moral facts in the same way that our scientific theories are you know like true in the story of abstract objects and composite objects right so we're going to get a counterfactual like if there have been non natural moral facts then what putin is doing in ukraine is morally wrong right so they're going to be fraught, like moral claims are going to be fap true if non naturalism is the right semantics but either way the applied ethical question is going to be the interesting moral question the normative ethical question won't be but like the the applied ethical question is it wrong to eat meat is going to be the interesting question we're going to argue for that not by like first figuring out what wrong means but just like arguing for it based on like premises and going like look at the way factory farming works it's horrible it's wrong and so you just the applied ethical questions just survive unscathed which i think is just the right result yeah no, I, I agree with that i think i mean in the case of the non-naturalist um realism um or really kind of any view that treats it seems to me like um so moral facts like obligations um duties values as these like primitive stance independent notions um so i guess it's one thing to go non-factualist about those to me i'm not even I'm I'm not even sure I understand the story. So maybe I, I can't even I can't even go that far. Um I'm not even sure what these are supposed to be. I mean maybe that's just what you're saying as a non-factualist thing. Like yeah. it's sort of unclear what they're supposed to be. Um yeah. so I guess I might say the same thing there. And they well. don't do anything yeah. because the, the moral facts should be supervening on the non-moral facts, right? Like right. it's incoherent to have like two possible worlds where everything is the same like at the micro like Putin is doing exactly what he's doing for the same reasons or the same consequences. In this world, what he's doing is is wrong, and in this one, it's not wrong because some non natural moral stuff is there. It's like that's incoherent to me. Well, and even if you add in supervenience, um, like it's still like for my practical purposes, like if I believe that there was this. You know, realm of these facts or whatever that supervened on those um, natural facts. It's like okay, but I'm still going to be doing the things that I cared about doing, and I'm still going to be, yeah. um, you know. So like, that's not an argument against realism. It's an argument for against me not. It's, it's an argument for me not really like caring about it, even supposing I could understand it. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, that's a, another big topic that was kind of. Just wanted to see how you um, would apply this to that. So yeah, so uh, to wrap up, I normally include a question about um, what the what do you think the kind of value of of philosophy is, kind of generally. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just include that. Like, what what do you think? Um, what do you think the value of philosophy is, um, especially, um, I guess, to you, but socially. Um, uh, the value of philosophy is and and this sort of metaphysical theorizing and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I think there's two ways to answer this question. Like the kind of philosophy I do is is like obviously super esoteric and not very applied to the real world in any kind of direct way. I think the value just lies in like being part of like 
an educational system and a research system in which like young people can come to college and just like study all sorts of esoteric stuff. And we've got this broad research program where we're just researching everything. And then we're just a better society for like doing this. And in philosophy in particular is like, um, it just makes you be a more reflective person. If you study philosophy, you become a certain kind of reflective person. And there's a lot of value in that just intrinsically. It's like, cool. Um, that's one thing. A second thing is like, just basically the study of philosophy is like a study of thinking. And so you become a better thinker. And so like a better problem solver, you're just like better in the world and in a very pragmatic way, if you can think well. Um, so that's two things. And then there's a third thing, which is like, maybe sort of like dreaming for the future that like, and I, I maybe it's not pure dreaming because I think like philosophy is actually drifting this way of like more pragmatic things, philosophers being interested in more pragmatic questions that have direct impact on the world, right? So not my kind of philosophy, but I'm like a pluralist. I think like let a thousand flowers bloom and like, I think it's great that we have a system where people can be doing like super esoteric stuff like my book and some people love it, but I think it's also good if philosophy is also like, let's get our hands dirty and actually like solve some, use philosophy to solve some societal problems. And I just think it's like a division of labor because like someone like me, I'm like, I'm just way more interested in the super esoteric stuff, but lots of brilliant people are interested in these like real world problems and philosophy can be used to be like, this is the right way to solve this problem. Um, you know, so like I, you know, if like somebody's are using philosophy to argue that factory farming is wrong and like that gets combined with activism and maybe like we can put an end to factory farming, that's a good thing. And philosophy can play a role in making that happen. So there's three things like philosophy can be applied to real world problems. It can be used to help people become better thinkers. And it can just be part of this esoteric project of like thinking about esoteric problems in science and philosophy. Awesome. Very good. Um, yeah. So I think we'll wrap it up there just for people watching. Um, again, the book we've primarily been discussing is, um, uh, metaphysics officer in illusion toward a widespread non-factualism i'll include a link or two to where people can uh, purchase that on amazon um in the description um uh, but yeah this has been really awesome i really enjoyed this um uh, thanks for staying so long and uh, taking my questions it's been it's been excellent it's been great yeah thanks for having me it was fun